so wild. We can go around in circles trying to find us out. But if you're looking for the truth, you have to find it out. Yes, I can't go to space, so we hit the roof. Get it hit the roof. And it all came to light with 200 proofs. Now I'm just really sick of people lying to me. So when I tell the truth, don't come crying to me. Pick up the phone, get on the line with me. Line with me. Who you gonna call? Who you gonna call? And welcome everyone to Globebusters, the government supplied model of flat earth. I am your host, Bob Xanadude60, and we are back for another great season of Globebusters. Obviously, as many of you know, we have been away for, geez, about three months now. Um, I decided that I kind of needed to take an extended break and uh, did so because I had uh, uh, to get my house prepared for moving and you know, all the fun stuff that goes along with that. But uh, fortunately, we've had some really great help in doing that. So um, we are back and we have so much to talk about this season. Um, it's going to be a lot of fun. So we're very excited. And we even have a new uh, uh, Globebuster that uh, we're going to be introducing today. I'm sure many of you already know who he is, but uh, we're very excited to have him. So before we get to that, let's go ahead and introduce our panel. Uh, first up, as always, is Jaren from Jaronism. How are you doing today, Jaren? Doing great, Bob. Yourself? Doing fantastic. It's a beautiful Good. day in Denver, and uh, just uh, I'm really excited about this. Actually, I'm even a little bit nervous about this because it's been a while, and already kind of screwed up on the intro, getting double audio going again. <laughs> oh, I didn't notice it. So. From this end, it looks good, and it's uh, at least it's not me failing. So, <laughs> no, it feels good to be back. Uh, it's another day over 100 degrees here in the California Ouch. Valley. So, my house is like a, a sweat box. It's fun. Yeah, you know that is why I left Fresno um, in the San Joaquin Valley. Is we had one summer that we had I think 40 days uh, in a row that were over 100 degrees, and I'm like, you know what? Screw this. I'm out of here. <laughs> right. It's it's really unbearable. And, you know, everybody said, you know, every house here has an air conditioner, obviously, but if you run the air conditioner as much as you would need to, it like jumps your electric bill from, you know, less than $100 a month to over 400 That's what happened last year when we ran it just constantly. So we can't afford that right now. So uh, we just do the best we can with fans. I got a fan blowing on me from above, a fan from behind, and uh, we do what we can. No drinking warm liquids, lots of water, and uh, stay hydrated. <laughs> and don't and don't go outside. There's lots of rules. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. Well, the only good thing I can say about it is it's a dry heat instead of a humid heat. Yeah, uh, but it's hot. It gets pretty unbearable. Uh, you got to get your stuff done early in the morning, and it stays hot all day. You know, it's not like um, I don't know one or two o'clock and it starts cooling down. No, it's like uh, it's still 100 degrees at eight or nine o'clock at night. It's crazy. Yeah, crazy. All right, but. I chose to live here, so who am I really to blame other than myself? Okay, well, you know, um, I hear you. It's a little cheaper to live in the San Joaquin. Uh, you're in San Joaquin Valley, right? Is, is Merced there? Yeah. Yeah, it's okay. kind of all that same area along the 99, right? So, you know, Bakersfield and Fresno to the south, Sacramento to the north. Yeah, okay. Sounds good. All right, so we will move on then. And uh, next up, we have Iru Landucci from the land down under in Argentina. How are you doing today, Iru? Hello, Bob, Jeran, uh, Tabu, people in the chat. It's a really, it's, it's a pleasure to be a, again. And please, Bob, you know, the last three months doing shows with Jeran, uh, I don't think even the Jesuit used that kind of torture. So <laughs> don't 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 take so much time to move your stuff right. to another place, okay? <laughs> Iru, I no, told no. I told Iru before the show he got three screen chairs. I'm reducing it now. He's only got two. I I, I expect that, of course, okay. man. Two screen I'm chairs. I'm talking now. with you. No, no, it's it's <laughs> it's really a pleasure. It's really a pleasure to be again with the Globebuster because maybe we talk, uh, you know, off air that, but uh, I'm still a. 
I'm still first um, a fan and follow uh, follower of Globbuster show uh, before then be uh, you know uh, um, um, a speaker in Globbuster show. So for me, it's a really pleasure to be here again. Awesome. Well, we're glad to all glad as always to have you back here. Super. All right. And last but not least, and our newest Globebuster um, that we are absolutely thrilled to have. Um, you know, after, you know, Morgyle started having his problems and stuff, we knew that uh, we kind of needed to have another person to kind of fill in for him. And, you know, as I said before, we certainly hope that John gets, um, you know, through his issues. Um, he is definitely a friend of the show. He's a friend of all of ours. And, uh, you know, we wish nothing but the best for him. And uh, we just, you know, hope things are with uh, you. Uh, good, John, and uh, Godspeed to you. But in the meantime, and uh, well, actually on a permanent type of basis, we have Ben Taboo Conspiracy, <laughs> and uh, he will be joining us uh, from this time forward, and we are thrilled to have you. How are you doing today, Ben? I'm doing very well, and uh, I, I actually I'm a little nervous, and so excuse me if I fumble all my words and all that, but uh, I just want to say it's a tremendous honor to be here. Globebusters has always been the best show, so to actually be on it is just kind of a quite humbling, but I just want to also add, I... Excluding the drama, I love everything about the Flat Earth. I love everything it represents. I love the fact that we're absolutely, I think we're changing the world here. And uh, people are waking up, and it's just an amazing thing to be a part of it. So I just hope I can contribute a little bit to that. Yep, absolutely. Well, I think that uh, you're going to nice do words. just fine. And uh, yeah, Thanks. very, very well said. <laughs> Okay, guys, so um, I'm, I'm getting some complaints that I'm my audio is a little bit lower than everybody else's. And so I have uh, made a couple adjustments. Hopefully, um, that will clear it up. If not, let us know in the chat, and uh, we will try and make it better. But uh, got to bear with me a little bit. It's been so long since I've run these controls, it's like, wow, I don't know if I remember how anymore. But no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> we just got to get things uh, set back up. So beautiful. All right, guys, so um, let's go ahead and close that out. So we have a few things that I want to talk about, um, well, several things I want to talk about. The, the main topic of the show, which we will get to a little bit later on in the show, um, is about the, it's called the government supplied model of flat earth. And why did I title it that? Well, the reason I titled it that is because it seems that even though the government would love to have us believe that we are on a spinning ball that's flying through space at thousands and thousands of miles an hour, uh, actually millions if you really want to get down to it, um, it seems that uh, all of their engineering research and uh, everything that is done and calculated on the Earth is based on a flat, motionless, non-rotating Earth with a firmament, believe it or not, which I think is pretty um, amazing. Uh, that the government has uh, made these type of concessions. Now, they didn't make them uh, intentionally or on purpose. Um, some of the uh, documents that, uh, well, actually all of the documents that we will be covering today uh, were recently, or were declassified. Uh, but at one time, they were held as top secret or secret or classified or whatever, which, you know, when you look at the nature of the documents, if they're so innocuous, you really have to wonder why the CIA or NASA or the Army uh, would classify them as such. So, um, yeah, that's going to be some interesting um, stuff that we go through on that. And uh, uh, I, just, I just find it absolutely amazing. And uh, I'll kind of elaborate on that a little bit more. So um, before we get to that, um, let's see. Let's, let me get out of this. Um, by the way, I was trying to find some uh, memes like to run in the background, and you, you I typed in flat earth memes, and I went through something like 60 pages and never really found any flat earth memes anymore. All you have is flat earth debunk stuff. We are absolutely being so unbelievably censored. It's, it's ridiculous. And again, you have to ask yourself, why? Why, if flat earth is so stupid, or is there such a concerted effort to, um, you know, censor it, right? Pretty crazy. Absolutely. And didn't we, yeah. uh, I thought I heard Iru before the show. Iru, did you say you lost your English channel completely? Yes. Uh, one day, uh, one night, I was, you know, just going to sleep. And the next day when I wake up, I receive a message that they directly 
they delete the channel without even you know possibility to know why how many i i always i always comment that because my time is limited as you know <laughs> any human being out there um i was uploading videos that i consider that there are you know nice information and time to time i make my own english um uh, type of uh, videos uh, about my, my research in Spanish, I try to translate and do in the English version. But, you know, maybe 60, 70% of my videos in that uh, channel was, you know, sharing uh, video from you, from Taboo Conspiracy, from other YouTube channels. They are not exclusive in, in terms of flat earthers. I also talk about uh, 5G, you know, uh, Germanic medicine and so on and so forth. So I don't know where uh, I, you know, uh, I break the rules of YouTube because all that videos that I upload in, they are not, uh, you know, copyright um, uh, stamp. So Did they, give you they any delete warnings? my channel. They, they didn't give you warnings and strikes? No warnings, no warnings, no strike. Uh, they shut down and, you know, accused me that my content was, uh, you know, break the rules of um, the policy, the policy, um, policy, policy is mm -hmm. the term? Yes. Okay. Uh, of YouTube, uh, you know, uh, YouTube policy. So they, they delete my, my complete channel. And right now, because, you know, all these kind of warnings that you, you suffer in, in person, Jeran, with a PayPal account and that kind of stuff, I'm start checking out my videos in Spanish in my uh, YouTube um, Spanish channel. And I'm start to take out uh, any kind of video that has, you know, maybe 50, 20 seconds of copyright claims. So I am uh, delete myself and re-uploading with a little trick that I'm used uh, in Adobe Premiere, uh, just changing the time of the audio and put some pitch shifter so the voice is maybe a little more uh, groove but uh, with just with that simply uh, technique you can change the you, you can champ the the copy the copyright claim in terms of audio and when i use some kind of video that is detecting by some in, uh, artificial intelligence i use like a cartoon filter like a half tone filter that is just in style cartoon a plugin and right now that is working so i i am just you know clean up my youtube channel in terms of uh, my spanish channel because i don't want to have that kind of issue in the future yeah it's hard work uh you know i'm doing the same thing with with my channel i've had to do that a while and i know a lot of videos were removed by youtube but some were removed by myself as well just because of copyright issues and i've been doing the same thing you're you know taking those videos down and trying to adjust them and uh, just really kind of cleaning up the channel because, yeah, you have to stay away from the same thing. So they definitely make us work hard to keep everything up. Yeah, we, we have the, uh, the, you know, for me, sometimes I can, I like to use uh, some videos that, you know, maybe came from the BBC or, or you know, right. History Channel or whatever. But because, because we are uh, against the system, we need to prove, you know, quote unquote, to the regular people Right. that what is the official narrative so you need to use that because if you just say for yourself nobody's going to believe you so for have some kind of uh, psyche impact you need to show you need to take the time and digest for the others uh, and, and show that kind of evidence so we are like in, in obligation to show that kind of uh, um, uh, sources uh, anytime that we claim you know whatever so uh, i i need to do it and uh, of course the, i can have the copyright problem so i'm start to you know working on some easy really easy techniques to avoid that so i gonna even i can share then with the with the people how i you know avoid that copy claim uh, copyright claims yeah, no, it's pretty frustrating if you do, you know, two to three hours of a live stream and then you show 45 seconds of a BBC, even if you're making commentary, even if you're making critique, which should be allowed by fair use standards, uh, they'll still nail you. They've got that, uh, you know, content matching system, which, again, 
you know, Eru doesn't have, I don't have, Taboo Conspiracy doesn't have, and we don't want it. You know, I don't mind if other people take my videos and, and use them in theirs or take uh, sections of it and use it in their own video. That's great. I like that. But of course, BBC doesn't have that. They've, they've just got the ability to see that you included a 45 second clip and they just uh, copyright it right out. Yep. Or, or block it, yeah. or block yeah, it worldwide. And, 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 and... Go, go ahead. Oh, like, Bob, like, like Bob says, uh, you must be wonder why they are so des desperate. You know, I don't say about copy claims because, of course, anyone out there has the the right, if you want to see in that way, that, okay, I take the time, I put the money, and I produce, uh, you, you know, original content, okay, that's right, you are in that kind of position, uh, but, um, you know, the, the other part, the, all this, um, uh, uh, you know, the... The the, 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 um, the attacks that uh, the flat earth community and conspiracy community itself uh, suffer is because uh, they they are in panic mode. Uh, I mean, we are so many people out there, you know, putting all, all our efforts and our mind and our heart uh, to, you know, spread the word that they are worried. Uh, they are worried right now because if not, there is no, there is no other reason that they are so des des desperate. Yeah, totally agree. That's, I totally agree too. It's 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 absolutely ridiculous. So and and because of that, guys, obviously, um, <laughs> uh, it would be greatly appreciated if you would uh, get on your favorite social media and share this show, um, because obviously YouTube is certainly not going to help us. So it's really up to the community itself to get the word out that uh, Globusters has returned, and uh, you know, kind of do that for all of your favorite uh, flatter shows, um, because again. You know, every at least right now on Facebook and uh, you know some of the other social media platforms, they're not blatantly, uh, or at least not as badly uh, censoring flat Earth. So at least we can get the word out that way and uh, try and get some viewership back. So we would appreciate that if you would do it. So super. All right, guys. So um, next thing I wanted to cover um, is a guy named David Lapointe, and you guys may remember him um, from. Geez, I guess it's been two, maybe three years ago that we first highlighted his work. Um, David came out and did a three-part series called The Primer Fields, which, uh, of course, like I said, we, we highlighted it on, on Globebusters because we're very interested in the magnetic topic. And he had some very, very astounding material in this. And he was pretty, you know, pretty close to the vest about it. Um, he didn't really say much to anybody about it. And now all of a sudden he has reemerged. Um, uh, just, I think it was just last night, um, I saw a, a video pop up by him. This particular video blew me away. It's like, oh my God, I thought this guy was just, you know, gone completely. But uh, he comes on and he starts talking about uh, how he has been laying low a little bit. But um, he has been convinced by uh, his peers and people around him to share um, his particular work. And so he has done so. And he says that if you go to the primercube.org uh, website, which is this one right here, um, you are able to download, and I've already done this, all of his documents and all of his uh, work that he has done. He's making it freely available to everybody. And uh, I haven't had a chance to go through this, but he's got uh, 203 megabytes of information um, that he is just willing to give away. In fact, he wants everybody to share this as much as possible. And uh, after I go through it, uh, we may be talking about it a little bit more. But uh, I just think that it's amazing that uh, he is back. And I'm uh, glad to hear from him. Do you guys remember him at all from our previous shows? Not offhand. Not that I don't. Okay. The name sounds oh, familiar, but what? He, he did these, the, the primer fields in, let's see, let me mute this. But he, he uh, showed, let's see, let's get to some of these. Remember the balls? Oh, um, okay. Yeah, I remember that. It's <laughs> been a long time. But, uh, yeah, some fabulous work, and, and it's really amazing, the stuff that he's come up with. And like I said, you know, I've been on this magnetic kick for quite some time. And uh, this is one of the first things that really caught my eye quite a while back. So I wanted to let everybody know that he is back and, um, you know, amongst the living once again. So that's pretty super. All right. And following up that train of thought, because this, this actually kind of applies to a lot of the stuff that we're doing today. Um, Ken Wheeler, a.k.a. Theoria Apophysis, 
um, last night also released a new video uh, called More Secrets of Magnetism. Is, have any of you guys seen this one yet? No. I'm not. Okay. Wow. You guys are just behind the times. Unbelievable. <laughs> <laughs> This is well, why anyway. Bob's so awesome. <laughs> Bob Bob gives us all the things that we need to watch. It's like homework uh, assignment. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, and I will put this in the um, show notes. Guys, can you hear me? Yes. Um, yeah, go ahead. Can you hear me, guys? Yeah, we hear you. Ah, okay. No, 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 because I'm changed. I, I'm changed. I'm changed the device. Uh, so I'm going to be following the show, but no, from my computer, from my cell phone. So I just want to check uh, that everything is. It's good. And the primary field uh, video and research are really amazing. I, I have a lot of that. Um, I take out a lot of information from that, and I prepare my presentation about the electric universe that I uh, that I did uh, a few months ago in, in Barcelona. And I it, it's a really nice, um, a nice topic and very... Uh, with a lot of information in that kind of uh, documentary. And the King Wheeler video, no, I, I don't even know that he released a new video. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty cool too. And and uh, Cammy went nuts when she saw it last night. And I did too, because he reveals something that is absolutely amazing um, about these uh, accelerations, these field lines of uh, magnetic, and he also calls it, uh, well, first of all, let me just say, it says that, Ben says that you're on hold. Um, ben just sent a message that says he's on hold. Do you have any idea what that means, guys? Uh, it <laughs> looks like his. I do see his little image up there has a pause button. Let me see if there's if there's a way to unpause it. Remove from call. Mute. Hmm. Never seen that before. See a little pause button. Yeah, um, I I don't I, I don't know what he's doing. <laughs> that little pause, I never I never saw it. Yeah, I don't know how to put yourself on hold. Uh, yeah, I'll just tell him. Either. I'll tell him to hang up and pick back up. Yeah, yeah. Just disconnect Ben and come back in. That's really weird. Um, all right. So anyway, all right. So getting back to uh, theory hypothesis. Now, many of you guys may remember the big hubbub about gravity, and you know we definitely have some mixed opinions on this panel. But you know, even after talking about it, um, we actually believe that we share more similar views than than you know we previously thought and one thing that that i have to make absolutely clear to everybody is that um we don't know what causes this you know apparent acceleration or whatever it is that's something we have no idea what it is um now ken wheeler in this particular video and i'm going to play a little clip of this um, we'll say straight up, you know, well, there is no such thing as gravity in, especially in the context that it is being presented in the mainstream. And to that, I absolutely agree. I do not believe that mass attracts mass, even though um, there have been some people that I truly respect that have made a very good hypothetical case for it. Uh, even he admits that there is no way to actually prove it. But so a lot of people have been kind of following along with Ken Wheeler and he's talking about this dielectric acceleration that happens as a part of a magnetic property. Um, it also happens as an electric property. And he says that, you know, that, that my magnetism, electricity and quote unquote gravity are three heads of the same hydra. They are some sort of a, an acceleration that, you know, takes place. But, um, he went a little bit further and he showed something very interesting in this particular video that I want everybody to check out um, about where these accelerations are accelerating to. And this is the really bizarre part. So I'm going to play this clip um, a little bit and uh, open it up for you guys' comment on this, see what you think. So here we go. There you go. I got two little, uh, two little uh, cube magnets, little cylinder magnets, and I'm going to put them at uh, mutual acceleration, there's no such thing as magnetic attraction, by the way. What we call, uh, humans call magnetic attraction, actually is dielectric acceleration. Magnetism is by definition a denotation, force in motion. It cannot be mutual uh, mass acceleration. The only thing that differentiates out gravity, what human beings ignorantly think gravity is, and what so-called magnetic attraction is, is one and the same thing, but magnetic attraction does not exist at all. But that premise has existed within human minds for thousands and thousands of years. What I'm actually going to do is you're going to see people think, well, magnets accelerate towards one another, and they actually don't. I'm going to show you underneath the supercell here what they're actually accelerating tor towards, and you'll see it underneath the... Uh, 
the supercell here, you'll see actually a little portal created right immediately between the two. They're actually accelerating towards a... Because no everything is pressure mediation. The secret primer of Mother Nature is not only force of motion, inertia, and acceleration, centrifugal divergence, and centripetal convergence. Again, the conjugate geometry of magnetism and dielectricity, which is respectively the torus and the hyperboloid, but the also the other base layer or basement uh, foundation of cosmic mechanics is everything is pressure mediation, you know? Very, very simple. So they're actually accelerating towards a null point in counter space, and you will see that underneath the supercell here. And you're going to see, well, I've got one magnet here and one here. And uh, you can, there we go. You can actually see. Let me center it up correctly. Because over here on the left, so I've got both hands being used right now. The, the, uh, the hole on the, the far left here, or whichever way you're looking at it, bottom left, whatever, over here, that's one pole of the magnet, and over here is the other pole of the magnet, but this hole right in the center, there's nothing there. What these magnets are accelerating towards, and I'm holding them tightly to keep them from accelerating, is the no pressure point in counter space. See, they're not accelerating towards one another. No, no girlfriend. See, this hole right here wiggling the most, yeah, that's one pole of the magnet. The other pole of each magnet is out of view of the uh, camera, and the other pole of the other magnet is over here, but that uh, black spot in the center, there's nothing there. Well, sure there is, because the ether is everywhere, but it's also nowhere. Unmanifest ether is, of course, what we mean when we say counter space, what we mean when we say um, the ether, what we mean when we say zero point energy, what we see, Mother Nature doesn't give a shit what stupid human beings call it ether, counter space, zero point energy. She doesn't care. But what they're accelerating towards is the lowest pressure mediation between their two. They are not accelerating towards one. Sure, magnets accelerate towards one another. Everybody's witnessed that now for thousands of years. You take two magnets and they accelerate towards one another as magnetic attraction. A, that's not magnetism. B, it is dielectric or mutual mass acceleration. Specifically, it is point source acceleration, which is a distinction only in attribute between so that and so-called gravity. But they're not accelerating towards one another at all. They're accelerating towards a null pressure point in counter space. Because you can see it right there. You see that black spot right in the center? Yeah, there's nothing there. But you can see it with the uh, supercell here. Okay? Okay. So, <laughs> what did all of that mean? Uh, that gets a little bit um, complicated, but the bottom line is is that what we're seeing these fields go into with that spot in the middle is something that is not created by the magnet itself. Um, he calls this a counter space or an, indeed the ether. And this is something that is so far outside of our normal realm of thinking that it really takes a lot of uh, you know careful thought to work your way through this. And this is what he is saying that magnetic fields are, uh, as well as this so-called gravitational field, right? Um, whatever is, is actually causing this. So basically what, you know, what he's saying and, and what we're talking about is something that, that only, you know, very high level type uh, electrical engineers have even gotten into this type of uh, consideration. Uh, and in fact, this is one of the, the subjects of study that my friend uh, that is the PhD candidate for electrical engineering is going very deeply into, and hopefully he's going to be sharing some uh, information uh, on that with us. But uh, to say that it's going to take a while to kind of explain this in such a way that people are going to be able to understand it clearly um, would be an understatement because it is a completely new paradigm in thinking. Uh, but we are going to endeavor to do that, um, as I understand it more. And I've been following uh, Ken Wheeler for a long, long time. And, you know, as you can tell, you know, when he goes through this so fast and he's using these terms like, you know, the conjugate, uh, you know, feedback and the point source acceleration, stuff like that, most people are just left with this blank look on their face. So we're going to try and endeavor to uh, simplify that <laughs> in the future. But the thing that I found very interesting about this is that he was able to actually show on a supercell that all of a sudden we've got these magnetic field lines that are accelerating towards apparently nothing, right? And so what's the explanation for that? Pretty interesting stuff. Iru, uh, uh, are you uh, any more familiar with this at all or is this all news to you too as well? No, no, I am really aware of this because for me, the, the electric universe 
terms not not in, in, you know from the Thunderbolt project I, I mean in general terms the electric universe is one of the most coherent uh, you know um, uh, theory if you want to see in that way because of course when we're trying to explain what happened up there uh, in the sky it's all about theories because we cannot uh, touch it or, or prove you know effectively that that is the case that we think it is sorry for the for the noise, um, but uh, when I start to study the electric universe, King Wheeler one uh, was one of the first names that appears uh, recommended, and of course Nikola Tesla. But uh, when I when I start to do the research uh, from my electric universe presentation, uh, you immediately go out go back in history, and you know that the Vedic and all these. Um, uh, you know, uh, Hinduist cultures, they talk about the same thing. I mean, they talk about the electric and magnetic universe, and they really explain it in detail, and in fact, they draw, uh, it's, it's a, uh, I, I don't have my computer right now to show what I'm talking about, but when you go, for for example, with uh, the what is called uh, Siri Shantra, uh, which is a term that uh, means uh, you can translate as a mechanism or instrument, but it's a typical drawing that you see like four corners and something in the center, and it's like a, a 2D representation of a 3D magnetic field. Uh, in, in, and even if you can even uh, see in fourth dimension, and it's really amazing because all these cult cultures that we think that are, you know, uh, ancient, and that uh, means that they are not capable of explaining or has uh, have this kind of uh, understanding in terms of technology, uh, it's a complete lie. In fact, if you go to the biography of Nikola Tesla, you immediately uh, realize that all these guys, in some part of their lives, they go to India or, or they have contact with Vedic. Uh, in fact, Nikola Tesla was a really uh, big friend of a Vedic guy. I, I can't remember the name. But all that, uh, you know, all the things that Ken Wheeler or Nikola Tesla himself talk about the electric universe, uh, all the cultures know that. We are the <laughs> most dumbest, you know, generation that they brainwash uh, our, you know, consciousness and, and brain. Yes, absolutely true. And, and a large part of that, of course, is when, you know, science essentially got hijacked uh, when Einstein, Einstein came onto the scene to change the complete paradigm of, you know, what science had progressed to before that by, you know, people like Henri Poincaré and, and, uh, That's right. yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, Poincaré, it's, Poincaré is, is the, the base of uh, Albert Einstein uh, theory. Yeah, exactly. That, that's where that came from. And, uh, you know, James Clerk Maxwell, all these other people seem to have it right. And they seem to understand the counterspatial relationship to uh, electric and magnetic fields, um, and even you know, even to some degree, you know, they they kind of delved into that with these so-called gravitational fields, that these are some sort of a counterspatial manifestation um, of the ether itself. And of course, Einstein comes along and completely derailed um, the entire idea of ether by eliminating it mathematically, you know, in his uh, uh, theory of special relativity. And at that point, that's when science really took a wrong turn. And now we really have not progressed all that far because honestly, I think that had we stayed on that path and people actually really pursued this, um, at least the ones that were getting any attention, obviously people like El Eric Dollard and uh, you know several other people that Aaron Murakami uh, highlights, um, we would have been on a completely different paradigm right now with free energy everywhere uh, so-called anti-gravitic devices have, will have been would have been developed, and our understanding would have been just light years ahead of where we are right now. And uh, you know that's that's. Hey one Bob, of the other can things. I ask a, a, a question oh, sure. about that? Excuse excuse my ignorance, but uh, he mentioned Theoria mentioned that uh, the ether is everywhere. Um, that's the first time I've kind of ever thought about that. What does that mean, and how does that relate to what the FOG group and Seventh Day Truth Seeker are, are, are doing right now? Okay, well, that's actually a really good question. Um, the ether is, is everywhere because essentially the ether is where all of our field 
um, theory would would actually come from, even though, like I said, the field, current, as, as Ken Wheeler says, current day scientists really don't have any idea what the field is, and, and that's mainly because they simply cannot call it what it is, and that's the ether. Now, they have gone on since Einstein, and now they call it the quantum field, right, which is another big piece of nonsense. You know, quantum mechanics is, is utter BS. Um, the, the cult of, of counting particles, I think they call it. But the ether itself is this counterspatial um, type of field. In other words, it's, it's definitely there, but it is where it is the medium that allows light waves to propagate or more, more succinctly put to be induced, okay? Because the speed of light, again, is a rate of induction of this field into the ether itself. So the ether is all around us. It's all over the place. And where this comes into with uh, EpiCore's work and the fog, um, which, by the way, I have some really great news about that, um, is that, you know, we've been claiming since day one that what the fiber optic gyros and the ring laser gyros have actually been detecting is the rotational properties of the ether itself and not the... Uh, rotation of the globe, right? And like like the Globers would love to have you believe. And they can do that very easily because, whoa, well, Einstein said that it doesn't exist and, and therefore it must be so. But, uh, you know, Einstein is just one person and unfortunately, you know, as much as they try to prop up Einstein and, you know, claim that he was right all along, and you always see those articles, Einstein proven right again. It's like, no, he wasn't. And, and in fact, they're completely <laughs> distorting it it's so badly, it's unbelievable. But you know, Einstein wasn't even close to the mark, but suffice it to say that the ether is there and it is the, a rotational field that is rotating and it does appear to be uh, a field, so to speak, of, uh, that is formed into a toroid, much like a magnetic field. Um, now, I know this is a little bit difficult to understand, but the, the counterspatial field is, uh, is, would be called a 90-degree point away from the electromagnetic field at any point along that electromagnetic field. So um, I know that's a little bit hard to visualize, and I wish I was better at graphics. I could show something like that. But suffice it to say that it basically is a kind of a ghost mirror of the uh, electromagnetic fields that we do. So what we have found out about the ether and, you know, in our investigations of it with the fog is that Obviously, if you want, if the fiber optic gyro was truly measuring Earth rotation and it was as simple as that, then you would be able to take a measurement with the fog um, at, you know, a specific latitude and then uh, do the math on that. I think it's uh, 15 degrees times the sine of the latitude will give you the specific rotation rate. But um, that rotation rate should be the same always, always, always on that specific latitude, right? Because if the Earth's rotating, um, you know, it's going to be the same everywhere else. And in fact, that would be, be definitely true. But when you start thinking about... Hey, are, fiber, are you referring to speed or are you referring to like rotations like per hour? Because I would understand that the higher you go, that like for instance, a mountaintop would be on a globe model would be rotating faster than the, a lower elevation because at a speed rate, not revolutions per minute, but at a speed rate. Am, am no, I misunderstanding no. here? It would be the opposite, no. I think. It, yeah, it's the opposite. It, it, no, it would not be at a higher level. It would be rotating faster. In fact, it, it's still, it doesn't matter if it's above it or not. It's still going to be rotating at, you know, say at the equator, it'd be 15 degrees per hour. And it doesn't matter if you would be at sea level or you would be at 10,000 feet above sea level at the equator. It's still going to show a rotation rate of 15 degrees per hour period right? okay so it's degrees per hour I, I, okay I, I was thinking speed because for instance if someone launched it under the, the the globe model someone put up a weather balloon at a hundred thousand feet that balloon would actually have to increase speed to keep up with the ground below it yes and that's a very good point that's a very good point so yes i i should have specified uh a, a speed as far as degrees per hour okay which okay Okay, so 15 degrees per hour, of course, times 24 hours is 360 degrees uh, or one full revolution. But what we have discovered, um, and this, again, was a, a suggestion that was sent to us by our PhD candidate, a friend of ours, 
um, that he said, look, it's really quite simple. All you have to do is take these um, fiber optic gyro measurements uh, at different altitudes along the same point, uh, the same latitude uh, uh, anywhere on Earth, right? So that's what brings us to, you know, why Rick sent the fiber optic gyro finally to me um, here in Colorado. And, um, and then, of course, uh, now Chris Van Maitre has it because he's been going out. He travels all over the place and he does some great measurements and stuff. So last weekend, uh, well, actually, let me start. Uh, about three or four weekends ago, uh, we took it up camping uh, to Guanella Pass. And Guanella Pass is around 11,000 feet at the summit. Uh, our campsite was just over 10,000 feet. We took measurements there uh, and then took measurements at the summit of Guanella Pass. And then we went and we went south, uh, excuse me, went east um, along that same latitude line. And we took measurements again. And lo and behold, we were getting variations of over one degree per hour, which should not ever happen if this was just a ball earth. Um, and now last weekend, we went up to uh, Pikes Peak. And Pikes Peak is 14,115 feet, something like that above sea level. Um, and we did several uh, measurements there. And then Chris, uh, just yesterday, went to a place called Arapaho, Colorado, um, which I believe is somewhere around 4,000 feet. Anyway, we had a 10,000-foot variance, and that data is currently under review. We will have that coming forward. But um, by the looks of it, uh, initially, again, we're starting to see, we're, we're seeing a very, uh, a fairly substantial uh, degree of variance uh, in on the same latitude lines at different altitudes, which should not happen on a ball rotating Earth, right? So... <laughs> This is, and, and, and what also this allows us to do is it allows us to kind of uh, determine a shape and, and a pattern of the, this rotational ether, right? So that's something that is under, you know, definitely uh, an ongoing project with FE Core. And uh, we will, of course, like I said, be releasing all of those results, um, you know, to the world to, for everybody to look at because we absolutely do want academia to look at this and, and explain it. It's like, how do you explain this? Because, you know, like I said, this is pretty simple for anybody to understand. You know, the elevation should make no difference on the rotational rate, and yet it does make a very substantial difference, which kind of blows the globe rotation right out of the water and brings the whole etheric discussion that Einstein eliminated mathematically right back into the equation. So hopefully that answers your question. <laughs> Yeah, well, I and, think the, the refraction and, uh, parents are going to answer you know, refraction, but go ahead. Yeah, go, sorry. Go ahead, Eero. No, 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 you know, just, you know, that, you know, so, can you hear me well? Yeah, we hear you. Okay, perfect. Well, you know, you know, talking about the ether, that for me, it's a word that comes from eternal. You know, it, it's, a, it's like a... Uh, what you're trying to say is that everything is permeated with that. You know, it's in every place, every corner, in every, you know, little space that you can find. Uh, and then, you know, it's just like, um, it's like, like uh, trying to prove the air is uh, composed in terms of uh, molecules of oxygen and water, for example. You know, I mean, you, you cannot prove that. Uh, you, you cannot show that. Uh, you cannot show the... Uh, you know, photons, the particles as photons in the light, uh, you know. So the ether, I am totally agree with you, Bob, and with other people that say, okay, the only way that we can, you know, trying to describe for the people, uh, you know, understand or make an image of that is just talking about the field. But nobody ever show a field of nothing. You cannot show a field of magnetism or, or field of electricity or particles in electricity. You, you cannot. You cannot even show a particle in gas. So talking about, for example, Eric Dollar, in one of the uh, last interviews that uh, he did, uh, he talks about the ether as the atmosphere itself, you know, but not the atmosphere in terms of the gases that are compound our atmosphere, uh, in terms of like a general field, you know, so I think, um, you know, Christian Huggins, uh, I believe, was the scientific, uh, the German scientific um, scientist that talked about the um, 
wave uh, the wave properties of the light, and in that time, some of the guys talk about the particle uh, nature of the light, and that is why they never, uh, you know, uh, they, they never match in that uh, concept because nobody can show even a wave. A wave is also a concept that the human use to describe something. But, you know, when you start talking in those terms, it's all metaphysics. You, you cannot prove that. You, you can the only thing that you can prove is that light propagate or the thing that we call light or electromagnetism waves or electromagnetism fields, whatever exists, because you can, you can see the result of that. But you cannot prove how it's made. It's, it's like a, the kingdom of uh, divinity, you know, if you want to see it in that way. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Uh, and, and again, this is why this is such a very, you know, difficult subject to explain to people, um, because it is a completely new paradigm in thinking. Um, you know, we've right. kind of been taken, you know, down this other path, and it just really screws with people's heads. So, um, yeah, I think it's 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 incredible. But I'd be lying if I said that I could always understand or follow Ken Wheeler when he explains <laughs> things. It's it's very easy for him. But like you said, Bob, it's a complete 180 from the way we've been trained and taught and indoctrinated. But for me, I'm excited to see it explained or simplified by you or anyone else because I'm always open to new information and new explanations. Whereas, you know, Globers out there are stuck in, well, uh, what Marty Leeds recently called intellectual Stockholm syndrome, which I think is so true. They're like in love with the, with the nonsense that they have been fed. And so they refuse to even imagine that what they were taught could possibly be false. So I love learning this new stuff and seeing it in new terms. And Ken, Willier's, uh, Ken, Willier, Ken Wheeler's brilliance begins with the understanding that simply because science agrees with a certain notion doesn't mean it's true. And so with new eyes can come new understanding and new understanding can bring new truth. So unfortunately, Ken Wheeler is way past like a first grade level, which is sadly the place that I need to start. But certainly hearing him say things like ether tells me he's on the right track and realizes science has gone off track into pseudoscience and folklore and really utter nonsense. Uh, but even magnetism is incorrectly understood. So I love to see him uh, present this stuff, and it'll be good if Bob can kind of make it simplified for us a little bit. Yep. Well, I will endeavor to do my best because, you know, I, I have to sit there and go over it time and time and time again and try and <laughs> right. a picture in my head. And unless you actually understand something very well, um, there's no way that you're going to be able to simply explain it, right, unless you truly right. understand it. So, um, you know, I, and I will be the first one to say that, you know, I'm uh, a lot uh, like you are, and a lot of people are, Jaron, you know, when, when Ken Wheeler talks, it's like, whoa, uh, we got to back up and completely, you know, <laughs> look at every single word um, that he uses and, you know, try and reframe that into the context that he's trying to convey. Because, man, he is really so far over people's heads. And he's brilliant. You know, if you look around the net at people that are following his work, and I mean, there are some really highly credentialed people that are, uh, you know, following his work. And they agree with him, totally. Uh, and this is really encouraging to see. So, I mean, this guy is just an, an amazing genius. So, uh, love to, loved to see it. But, so we'll move on forward. And Aero just sent an image. Um, Looks like a screenshot. Thanks, Aero. No, no, that was an error uh, from my <laughs> cell phone, guys. <laughs> No okay. worries, no worries. Maybe I'm me. gonna be a little bit uh, out of touch uh, in the next minute because I leave my car and uh, you know maybe the signal here, the satellites are not reached very well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I hate it when that happens. <laughs> All right. Okay. So anyway, we will definitely expand on that subject because I I think it's worth going to, and you know I would love to be one of the first channels out there that actually can. Uh, explain Ken Wheeler and what he is saying in layman's term. Um, that's a that's a tall order, but I'm going to try and fill it. So wish me luck. So okay. So next up, many of you may have heard that uh, Effie Core was doing a was was attempting to set a world record uh, microwave shot. Now, unfortunately, we did not uh, achieve what we wanted to do. We had some signs that we thought honestly that it was going to work very beautifully because we were getting the receiver to change states into a different mode where essentially it was saying yeah i'm getting the signal but it's not good enough to actually pass any data with any reliability so 
But even with all the tuning that we did on that, we still were unable to get that. Well, it turns out that, you know, we were trying to, um, you know, surpass another company that, uh, I don't know, I think it was last year sometime set a world record at 305 or 304 kilometers, something like that. Um, and of course, that in and of itself spoke volumes um, because when you looked at the antenna heights and you know, did the curvature calculations, there is no way, once again, that that signal should have ever passed. And as I have said many times when I did uh, my microwave work uh, with Western Telecommunications, we would bypass two to three sites and get very close to 200 miles. Um, and these were things like going across Kansas and Nebraska, right? So there aren't exactly a lot of high places to transmit from uh, that are that much further above the average terrain height. So, and the towers were about um, 60 to 80 feet is where the uh, dishes were at. So to be able to be up in the air essentially only 80 feet and transmit nearly 200 miles where you should have a few miles of curvature and get a reliable signal is over the top um, impossible, frankly. But um, so what we found out was is that when this company uh, did this, Bob, Bob. yes, you, no, I mean you are you are shooting uh, microwave uh, particles or or what? <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> no, uh, just the, the 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 microwave signal, the the field, the, the RF induction, whatever you want to call it, into the ether. But regardless, uh, it microwave propagates the same as light. Essentially, there you know, there may be some very minute differences, but not really, not really so much. So, anyway, so we found out that the company that did set the record got a special permit on these same type of antennas, five gigahertz antennas, um, to transmit at a little bit higher power. Now, the ones that we're using do not require any license whatsoever, and they are limited to a specific power input to them. So after our failure, what we did is we ordered a completely new setup that is, is still an unlicensed thing, but this time we have a much, much higher gain antenna, um, which will give us an effective radiated power of quite a bit more. Let's just put it that way. And we anticipate that we will be able to get some good results with this. So I'm going to go ahead and play this little uh, second promo attempt thing. And OK, Iru, we'll see you in about a half an hour. Um, I'm going to play this uh, FE Core uh, second attempt promo to just kind of let you know what's going on with them. And uh, then we will continue talking about this. So here we go. <laughs> FE Core are preparing for a second attempt to break the current world record for microwave transmission in the 5 GHz range. We ordered a new rig with a better transceiver and bigger antenna. The event will be live streamed like the last one. Reserve your ticket at fecore.org and watch us live. Those who ordered a ticket for the previous live stream will receive a free pass. Hydra. <laughs> Cannot set it back to. Now, sometimes I have 88, but mostly these 90s. Okay. Well, uh, just put, uh, put it in the 70s range, and then uh, oh, we'll yeah. switch it to slave. And then Gabber needs to adjust again. Wait a minute, man. It was. I. What do you mean, put it in the 70 range? I turned approximately 10 degrees to the right now. Yeah, I know. Turn it back. Uh, which <laughs> All right. So there's that. And again, uh, this will be coming up. We were going to try and get it done this week, but um, it. I don't think it'll be. Let's see. Uh, Mike sent me a thing. Uh, yeah, we're going to do the microwave test. 
the second weekend in, uh, in September, depending on the availability of the professional RF engineers participating. Um, so look forward to that um, on the second retry. And this time, I think with this considerably higher gain antennas, we will have no problem making that um, uh, 307 kilometer, whoopsie, uh, 307 kilometer distance. And uh, I'm personally looking forward to it. Uh, I we were very optimistic this time, but not quite. And of course, for us, what is going to constitute a valid and successful test is if we can not only make the link, but we can reliably paste, uh, pass data through it. And uh, you know, if we can get a decent digital signal through it uh, without a whole truckload of uh, checksum errors, that will constitute a successful test. And again, it'll be just another nail in the coffin of the uh, globe earth model in my opinion so there you go All right. so what do you think about the uh, counter arguments that are coming out about the that it's either ground wave propagation or that it's bouncing off of the ionosphere they're already coming up with these claims or it's just another one i've heard is just refraction well <laughs> first of all there, you know i suppose that there could be some validity to those but the thing is, is those are the exceptions rather than the rule. And just like, um, you know, the, the water test, the being able to see light over water, where they're saying, oh, well, uh, yeah, the, it's, it's refracting. And, you know, there's always these rare conditions that are allowing this downward refraction over water, when in fact, the norm is for, um, you know, over water for refraction of light to go upwards, right? So the Globers are always counting on that ultra rare circumstance um, right. of, you know, the opposite type of, of, of refraction going on. The same thing is going on here. Yes, it's possible, but a, as far as a matter of routine, not a chance. And that's <laughs> and this is what we should really expect, though. I mean, because what are they going to say? If, if we make a, you know, 400-kilometer connection, they're not going to just say, oh, well, I guess that means the Earth is flat. And it's just not going to ever come out of their mouths. So they have to come up <clears throat> with something. So we should just expect that. It's not really, it shouldn't be shocking that these guys have to come up with an explanation for it. It should be expected. So it's like, of course, we're going to make this connection. And of course, people like Simon, Dan, and these other guys are going to come back and say, oh, well, it's bouncing, it's reflecting, it's hitting the, because they have to. So I, I, I just get used to the point at, at this point <laughs> now of expecting it ahead of time. It shouldn't be shocking it's just like everything else, and I, I had to learn it the hard way, like I said, when I went to the Salton Sea, and these guys from the Independent Investigations Group were there, and we're talking about seeing these mirror flashes from too far, and they just say, oh, well, what you're actually seeing is that mirror flash travel through the atmosphere that's close to the water. And I'm like, wow, so it doesn't matter if we were seeing mirror flashes from 100 miles, 200 miles, then you could just say the same thing? And they said, well, yeah, essentially, yes, that that's what's happening. So I realized real quick, it doesn't matter what tests or experiments we come up with, they're just going to... Uh, come up with a reason why we're getting those results, which is ridiculous. But it does contradict everything that's stated in the industry right now. It doesn't odd. I mean, I thought, you know, in all the, all these calculators, all the, the U-Link calculators, everything shows that it will not go over that curvature of the Earth. And are they, are all, is the entire industry going to have to adopt a new new re reasoning behind this? I, I find it fascinating. Well, it's like Bob said, it's just that it's the one off, right? Because they, they'll find somewhere where it does say that it can reflect off a building. And therefore, if it can reflect off a building, then it can occasionally reflect off of the curve of the earth. And it can occasionally reflect off the ionosphere. And it can occasionally, you know, just ridiculous to me. Yeah, uh, exactly. And, 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 like, and how in the world can it bounce off of the ionosphere and maintain a continuous link? That makes zero sense. Kind of like when in my recent videos about the Nicobine system that they use the, the radio waves for targeting and they're saying, well, it was bouncing off the ionosphere or, you know, other ideas. And how can you do that when it's a targeting system? If things are bouncing off of the ionosphere, how in the world can you follow that? Yeah, Does exactly. That sense? Well, yeah, it absolutely makes sense. And here's the thing, Ben, about that. When, when you do these things or a microwave test specifically, you have to calculate for something that is called a Fresnel zone or Fresnel zone, however you want to pronounce it. And essentially what the Fresnel zone is, is a, it's an allowance for um, objects that could actually interfere or bounce, uh, reflect the uh, RF signal, right? And there's a calculation for it where it's, it is, you know, you want to be above that, that basic uh, zone where you can 
get these signals bounced back, right? So this is where the Fresnel zone calculation comes in. And the reason for that is, is if you are too low or too close to any other obstruction, what will happen is the signal will bounce and it will take multiple paths through the air. This is a signal that ironically is called multipath, all right? So when a signal multipaths, uh, what happens is you will get two different signals or multiple signals arriving at the receive antenna at slightly different times. Now, when you are trying to pass a signal that is digital, ones and zeros, and it's going at an extremely high baud rate uh, or you know data transfer rate, um, what will happen is you will get what's called checksum errors. In other words, it'll, it, the signal will say, whoa, whoa, wait a minute, this doesn't make any sense. Um, you know, and it will then request a resend of the packet, right? And if you get too many of those, you will get completely clogged up with the packet resends, right? Which makes the signal uh, either become very, very slow or absolutely unusable. And usually the latter is the case. It just becomes completely unusable, right? So what, when they say that, well, it's, it's taking, you know, bouncing off of stuff and, and arriving through multiple paths, um, you know, that... That could kind of work in analog signals, but uh, today in the 21st century where everything is digital and you have to worry about these checksum errors, it becomes virtually impossible um, to really accommodate for any type of multipathing. And that is exactly, once again, those rare miraculous conditions uh, that they want us to, uh, you know, want people to believe that, you know, well, that's what's happening. Well, that's the whole reason why we're doing data over a microwave. Um, because, again, we're looking for a reliable uh, signal path. And if we don't get that reliable, if we get a reliable one, then it tells us that we're not multipathing. Uh, if we don't get one, then, you know, that raises some questions. So there's your answer. So, all right. So, okay, so next up, and this is something that, that's in, in this next series, and this is the main body of the presentation here, uh, about the uh, government provided <laughs> uh, the government supplied model of flat earth and like I said there have been several documents that that specifically talk about you know the earth uh, all these uh, parameters RF propagation uh, all kinds of stuff that um, have been released in uh, uh, you know previously classified or top secret documents and again why when you look at the subject matter of these things why in the world would they have ever been classified, and, you know, these are documents that would normally go on in any uh, type of engineering. Now, one thing that I found out about these documents is when you try and look at their counterparts, like, for example, uh, signal propagation or, or flight dynamics over a curved rotating earth, right, you don't find them. And it's like, hmm, I wonder why you don't fly, find them, and because, you know, it would be utterly ridiculous. So what is the Glober's response to, to things like this? They say, well, they just do all this just to simplify, uh, simplify the equations and, and make it work. But, you know, that is utterly ridiculous if you think about it. What is being simplified? You, there is no, there is such a massive difference between a flat, stationary, motionless, non-rotating Earth and an Earth that is falling away um, at eight inches per mile squared from you know your point of reference and rotating at a, either 1,040 miles an hour at the equator or whatever it is uh, you know, as it goes up in latitude or down in latitude. These are variables that are extremely complex and they make a huge difference. So when the Glovers say, oh, it's just to simplify things, I'm sorry, but that doesn't cut it. And, and we're gonna you know, go into that a little bit deeper here. Um, but, uh, and, and then of course the documents that say things point blank, like, you know, things like, well, uh, we're, we're trying to measure the brightness from the firmament specifically and things like, we don't know what the shape of the earth is. And, you know, back in the forties, uh, you don't say, well, they were just trying to simplify it by saying, we don't, we don't know what the shape of the earth is. They will conveniently, you know, ignore those points. Right. <laughs> so yeah, pretty crazy. So what we're going to do is it's so funny because I wanted to cover this and then Rob Skiba decided he was going to release a video on this. And then shortly after he did, uh, uh, Flat Water, Flat Earth, uh, Flat Earth, Flat Water, whatever it is, Glenn, uh, who we've had on Globusters before, also released um, using these documents a, a uh, video on 
uh, the firmament and all the things that actually explain that. And we'll get into that a little bit deeper. But what I want to do right now um, is kind of go through this uh, document uh, with Rob Skiba and, um, you know, talk about it a little bit. So before we do that, does anybody have any comments that they want to make on this before we set off on it? No. Okay. I will take that as a no. Excellent. All right. So let's go. And, uh, you know, thanks to Rob Skiba for doing this. And he's, he's really a much better narrator than I am. I am uh, so I'm just going to kind of fill in the gaps uh, on this stuff. And uh, let's give it a listen. Here we go. Okay, so in the 1930s, we had both August Picard and the Russians sending up high-altitude balloons, and they're looking out, and they're not able to detect curvature. So we go forward about a decade to the 1940s, 1948. This is an official CIA, look up here, CIA.gov, okay, CIA declassified document from the Russians. I'm going to pull it up here in Adobe Acrobat. It's a little easier because I've already highlighted some stuff here. Same document. All right, so the subject is Earth Measurements, 1948, Moscow, Russia. Outer gravitational field and shape of the physical surface of the Earth. They're trying to figure out the shape of the Earth? Wait a minute. I thought we knew the shape of the Earth since Pythagoras and Eratosthenes, right? Well, apparently the Russians didn't get the memo. A study is made of the coordinates necessary for the solvability and uniqueness of solution of an integral equation by the aid of which the outer gravitational field and the shape of the physical surface of the earth may be determined. So we go through this document a little bit here. Uh, it says the methods of studying the shape of the earth, so this is what their goal is here. They're outlining some of that. The shape of the physical surface of the Earth can be determined with sufficient reliability on the basis only of data obtained from exact measurements. Well, that goes without saying, I suppose. And let's keep going down here. Let's see. We can regard the potential of the real Earth, by this equation here, apparently, as known correct to an additive constant, whatever that is, at all points of the physical surface of the Earth and only on the surface, whereas it is not determinable at all other points of space without knowledge of the shape of the Earth. So they're still trying to figure out the shape of the Earth here. But since the shape of the Earth is not known, the shape of the Earth is not known, 1948, the true coordinates of these points, B, L, and H, are unknown to us. So the Russians are having trouble figuring out the shape of the Earth in 1948. Let's look at another document here. Another. Whoops. Okay. But of course, the Globers will claim, "Well, it's an approximation, so it's it's you know, <laughs> you can't say that you don't know the shape of the Earth in 1948, especially when you think about this is the the, the Russians that are coming out with this, right? And this is was a classified document. It's been you know it was approved for release. Uh, it was a sanitized CIA document. Obviously, there are parts of it that are redacted, um, you know, but obviously they also cannot catch everything. I mean, they are human after all. They've got, you know, a fleet of people that have to release things for under freedom of information. Uh, things can only remain classified for X amount of time, then they have to be reviewed and then released. And let's face it, human error is one of the best things that that, that we have in this case because the, it has allowed these documents to come out. But, you know, why in 1948 would the Russians not know the shape of the Earth? They had the first satellite, the first man in space, um, supposedly. And, of course, even the first man in space, uh, Yuri Gagarin, um, that mission was debunked when it was realized that there was no way that he could have possibly seen Panama, I believe, uh, within minutes of his launch. And, you know, a lot of people have gone over this. So, you know, just like the phony Apollo missions, um, even the Russians uh, got kind of caught on that one, and they never decided to pursue trying to uh, compete anymore to send anybody uh, to the moon. And we know what a fiasco that turned into for the United States, right? <laughs> so, okay. So anyway, um, these documents are available. Let me flip the screen share over here to the right. So, um, again, I, we will make all these documents available, but it's very interesting. And Rob only covers these, this very uh, superficially on these particular documents. 
but it comes up over and over and over. The, the, shape, the shape of the listings, geoid is generally not determinal. Uh, okay, why? You know, supposedly Aristophanes uh, figured out the shape of the earth, you know, by sticks and shadows, um, you know, 2,000 years ago. And, <laughs> uh, you know, for the Russians to be coming forward and saying point blank that there is no way that you could possibly do that without very specific and precise measurements. Um, you know, and the, the powers that be would have us believe that Aristophanes had it all sewn up and he was within, you know, really, really close tolerances when he, uh, you know, supposedly figured out the, the shape of the earth, right? So, yeah, ridiculous. So, let me back up just a little bit. Um, one of the things that, that I wanted to kind of highlight before we went on to this, you know, in, in answering the questions, uh, of, you know, how did the government give us our model of the Earth? Well, first of all, a lot of it comes from these documents, but we also have the um, UN logo, right, which is very famous, and several other government agencies all around the world that have adopted the flat Earth or, you know, what appears to be identical to the Gleason's map um, as their logos, right? So... That, I think, is one of those cases that where they put, you know, put something right in front of our face. And I know there is a lot of opposition to the Gleason's map. But, you know, I think that, you know, frankly, it's the best map that we have to work with. Because, for one thing, it works perfectly on the ground. Um, and shipping companies use it. Air cargo companies use it. All kinds of companies use the, the uh, Gleason's AE or a very close um, a derivative of it. Um, for navigation, and it simply works. And of course, we all know what happens when we put that Gleason's map uh, in the former uh, nullschool.net uh, website that they used to have that AE projection, and we start looking at things, and everything seems to fall perfectly in place, um, you know, as far as going around in perfect circles uh, on the AE projection. So, in my opinion, and, you know, again, if you people want to think that anybody pushing the Gleason's map as some sort of shill, well then sign me up for a shill because I happen to believe that it's still the best representation that we have. And uh, granted, the I think some of the biggest objections that we have to it are the objections that come with viewing angles of the sun, moon, and the stars in the sky. But again, we have explained those or come up with very, very viable explanations, um, you know, with with uh, understanding the dome of vision, our dome of vision, and Jaron was one of the first people that, that came out with that. Also understanding that if, if the firmament, uh, which we're going to see that they acknowledge exists, if the firmament is actually there uh, and is acting also as a magnifying glass along with the, uh, the atmosphere itself, right, then this actually goes a long ways, in my opinion, in explaining uh, how we are able to resolve some of these apparent positions for the flat earth map. You know, I could be wrong, but is, to me it seems to work, especially when you do all kinds of demonstrations. Like, remember that demonstration you did, Jaron, with the uh, half magnifying glass and how it uh, shifted the position of the light? Right, absolutely. Yeah, yeah so what you, get, you always get these people that say, oh, well, the sun sets south of west, and, and yeah, they, they just don't understand that that's the way your vision would work uh, you know, with that kind of atmosphere. Yeah. And yet we can do this on a small scale. And if indeed, and the experts tell us, right, the experts are telling us that the atmosphere does act as a magnifying lens. Point blank, end of story. You know, we all saw it on the, that same guy that did the, uh, what you're seeing here is a mirage when he talked to the, um, right. you know, at atmospheric uh, expert. You know, he said, point blank, look, it's acting like a lens. It, it magnifies things. Uh, Rob Skiba's own experiments showed that to be so obviously true um, when he took the boat out on, uh, you know, one of the Great Lakes and was looking at uh, uh, the city across the lake, right? So, Right, when anyway, he was looking at Chicago. Right, at uh, Chicago, right. So, anyway, so that's that's one of the things that we have. And now, we have the government documents, and, and one of the questions that, that I would ask, um, you know, besides the government documents... What evidence do we have that support the assertion um, that, you know, it's flat and motionless and 
there is a firmament above us, et cetera, right? Well, obviously, we've done a lot of tests. Um, we've done the laser tests, and we've done mirror flash tests. Um, we've done laser tests over the land, frozen lakes, water. Um, and all of these things, we can see the laser beams, we can see the flashes um, over and over and over again. And again, the Globers will have, would have you believe that this is, gee, we just happen to hit that perfect condition every <laughs> single time, right? Uh, it's, it, it's crazy, right? So anyway, so beyond that, you know, beyond the mirror flash test and the lasers, we have uh, the microwave tests, right, that, that were performed uh, not by FE Core, even though I am confident we're going to set a microwave a test, but uh, my own personal experience with microwave going way further than it should, you know, it should be over miles of curvature and getting a solid lock on the signals. Um, we have Loran, right? Now, Loran, again, this is something that where they have the transmitters uh, hundreds of miles apart uh, along the coastlines, right, that are uh, allowing a kind of a triangulation between beams, which should never be able to happen. Because remember, the Loran system is being used for these, these watercraft, right, which are on the water. So as far as any... Um, you know, curvature allowance, there isn't any, right? <laughs> I mean, uh, it would be lucky to work a few miles, but uh, if the earth is truly flat, then all of a sudden you can get away with having several hundred miles apart on these these systems that, that Loran is using, right? Uh, ben, you recently did a comparison on, uh, uh, I forgot what it was called. Can you say that again? Nicobine? Yeah, the Nicobine system. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and, and Marconi, you know, I mean, I think it really starts with Marconi. And I, I love the pattern here is how every time, like they told Marconi that he, he could not do it. He could not get further than 200 miles. And then he, he, he sends that radio signal across the Atlantic and there should have been a hump of water in between there, five, 500 miles tall. I mean, 500 miles. And yet it's just, you know, wrapped around the curvature. I mean, it, Come on, that's getting a little bit of nonsense. But with the Nicobine, it was the same thing. Is uh, you had this uh, discussion with it, with the top scientists in the in the British government who were debating that. Oh, I'm sorry, but the, they couldn't do the Nicobine system won't work because the 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 high frequency waves don't bend around the curvature, and so uh, uh, there's no way that the the Germans were doing that. But uh, as it turns out, they were definitely doing that, and it definitely de defied any sort of uh, globe math. Um, Anyway, I, I, I find all of that so fascinating and, and the pattern of how they, all, the, all of a sudden these new ideas such as like the ionosphere come out or, or uh, uh, ground wave propagation, all these things come out after the fact, after these uh, experiments, uh, after these actual uh, uh, things happen. And so it, anyway, I, I, I think that the evidence there is so overwhelming with, the, with these, uh, the beam wars, with the microwave tests, all of that. Yeah. Yeah, you're absolutely right. It, it, it is. And again, the Globers would have us believe that, they, you know, well, we just happen to be hitting it just on this perfect time where all the conditions are right for this to happen. And it's like, come on, when is enough enough? When are you going to come out of your denial and admit that these are consistent, predictable phenomenon that, that work almost every single time, if not every single time, right? Um, uh, yeah, and yeah, we, if I could add with the Nicobine system, I mean, those those were transmitters that were sent from, one was from uh, Denmark and the other one was uh, near Holland. And and they're shooting them over, you know, 300 miles, uh, 400 miles to, to the, their targets. And how it would work is an airplane, a, a German bomber would follow one signal and wait until he crossed the second signal before he dropped the bombs. How can you do that when these things are, you know, bouncing off of the ionosphere? How can you do that? I mean, you would lose your targeting abilities because the all distances would get messed up when you're bouncing things off of different areas. Exactly, because when you're bouncing things, obviously the the arm of one one leg of that is going to be considerably further than the other. So uh, again, doesn't make any sense, and that is why the government is studying these phenomena based on a flat, motionless Earth, um, because that's the way it actually works, folks. Um, so anyway. So some of the other things that, uh, you know, lead us, that, that are evidence, in my opinion, uh, for a flat, motionless, you know, stationary Earth, um, and also that we're being lied to, right? Um, for example, like angular sizes of celestial objects. We've talked about 
isn't it amazing that the sun for something that is 865,000 miles in diameter in a matter of eight light minutes is reduced to one half degree size in the sky, right? Well, you know, and, and our star is fairly typical, right, supposedly. And, uh, you know, if you were to double that, again, because we have this inverse relationship of angular size, if you double that distance to 186,000 miles, then it should be a quarter of a degree in the sky. You double that again to 370 uh, million miles, then it's going to be, you know, on and on. You get the idea, right? So the, the question obviously then becomes, how is it that we are getting, you know, we're seeing things that are hundreds of light years away, like Polaris, which is either uh, 330 or 450 light years away, depending on what source you want to trust on that. Um, you know, how, how are we able to see it at all, right? Um, so, again, it's obvious that they are lying to us because these are de they are absolutely defying common sense, right? Doesn't make any sense. Another thing that doesn't make any sense is uh, the RF signal strengths. And this is something we're, you know, like we've talked about before. And they actually were going to come across in these documents where they are doing these, these uh signal attenuation test across a flat earth, right? And what they're finding is, is that, um, you know, there is a substantial drop off in signal. But if you want to listen to people like this lady, um, NASA would have us believe stuff like this. 80, the transmitters on the Voyager spacecraft are slightly over 20 watts, about what your refrigerator light bulb would give off. So when the signal crosses that vast distance to us, the strength of the signal is one ten trillionth of a billionth of a watt, which is the equivalent of one divided by ten with 21 zeros after it. According to NASA, with... <laughs> I, I, I love this. Clip. Wow. It's so absurd. <laughs> it's utter nonsense. I know. One ten trillionth of a billionth of a watt. And, and let, me, let me put that into perspective again for you guys. Most things, uh, most receiver sensitivities um, are down around, you know, best sensitivity is like one microwatt, right? And a microwatt is one one millionth of a watt, right? 10 to the negative sixth. And sometimes you can get a little bit better than that, maybe maybe three tenths of a microwatt, microwatt or, you know, really good signal, maybe a little bit better than that, right? But what this lady has just told us, the head of the Voyager project, right, has told us that it is coming in at one ten trillionth of a billionth of a watt. Now, first of all, uh, let's look at a billionth of a watt. Now, a billionth is another three places over, right, ten to the negative ninth, uh, which, first of all, that is called a picowatt. And a picowatt um, is simply not achievable as far as a receiver a sensitivity. You cannot pull that signal out of the noise. But they have to be even more ridiculous than that, right? You can't even get anywhere near picowatt uh, reception capability. But then they say, but nah, it's coming in at one ten trillionth of that billionth of a watt. <laughs> and wow. honestly, that's the craziest thing I've ever heard in my life. And this is the kind of crap. They want you to believe that these signals can go on forever and ever and ever. And the bottom line is, is that they must obey the inverse square law, right? So it, it's, it's an inverse relationship where uh, when you double the distance, the uh, intensity will be cut down to a quarter, right? Um, it's, just, it's just ridiculous. And light also follows the same, the same inverse square law. And Jaron did a great documentary uh, video on that um, that I have referenced several times. But you just got to love stuff like that. That you know that they're they they and people swallow this hook line and sinker and how anybody could have a doctorate in electrical engineering or even you know get past sixth grade in common sense and buy that is beyond me right so anyway so that's another thing another thing that would lead to our preponderance of evidence of course is um, you know NASA has been caught you know faking moon landings shuttle missions wires CGI. It just goes on and on and on. It's ridiculous, right? And then as I measured earlier, or as I you know, talked about earlier, the fiber optic gyro measurements um, are not measuring what people want to believe that they're measuring. And that's something that we will be elaborating on. And beyond that, 
You know, then you get into the blatant censorship, the massive propaganda campaigns against us, the armies of trolls that are unleashed, you know, all around us. I mean, the battle that we are fighting here, people, is beyond belief. They, they are hitting us with everything they have, and yet none of that can overcome common sense, which mo most people, you know, can recognize, right? So anyway, this is why we have all these reasons to believe that, yes, the government is lying to us on one front, and then, you know, in, through the methodology of declassified documents, um, that I'm sure they did not want to get out, they're telling us a, a very, very different story. So, all right, so let's continue on with this and see what else Rob has to say in these documents. Unless you have any comments from anybody, I'm sorry. I, I just wanted to add one thing. Um, one, one thing you don't see in these documents with respect to it keeps saying, you know, flat and stationary Earth is, well, how do they compensate for the Earth's rotation? I mean, if you, I've asked this question to a bunch of people is, if I set a balloon, a high altitude balloon straight up how long do, how high does it have to go before the ground below it starts to actually move away from the uh, to rotate away from the the, the balloon right i mean do, do, do they know does anyone know i'm actually thinking that they they say they assume a flat earth because i don't think anybody knows how they would compensate for these things because on, on one hand they say the earth's curvature turns the the, the foucault pe pendulum but uh, you have a level earth observer he drives a crane he parks that crane there, and uh, there's no no Foucault pendulum that's happening with it with the crane there, um, or or they say that you know the their spin is, is moving moving the Foucault pendulum, but why doesn't that have an effect on on the the weather balloon that's 128,000 feet? I mean, if if it can affect the pendulum, then Felix Baumgartner Gartner should be falling falling in the uh, Pacific Ocean. Um, so. The fact that I don't think that anybody knows how to compensate for these things because I don't think they know the answers to it. What the That's official good. answer is. I don't think the, they do either. Yeah, I agree. That's because there isn't an answer. And think about this beyond that, Benny. You, and you raise a great point here because we talked about this before. When Think about the Felix Baumgartner jump when he went up to, what was it, 128,000? Yeah. yeah, almost 130,000 feet. And when he first stepped off of that thing, well, first of all, um, he didn't even encounter any wind resistance, right, until he got down to, like, I, I think around 60,000 feet or below. Um, you could see that the, the, his clothing was not even moving. And here he was. He had accelerated past supersonic, right? He was going more than 700 miles an hour um, and just an unbelievable speed. And yet his clothes... We're not moving at all. Well, they tell us that the Earth is rotating or the atmosphere is rotating with the Earth, right? So at some point, when are you going to come into that wind that is going hundreds of miles an hour, if not beyond supersonic, which I believe it should have been for his particular position? Uh, it was still over uh, supersonic. When are you going to encounter that wind shear, right? When do you see that? You don't. And beyond that, it, not only would you encounter the wind shear with the wind you know, going with the rotation of the Earth, but the wind appears to be going in the opposite direction, which would only amplify that effect, right? So at some point, you should encounter, or he should have encountered, hurricane force winds that literally blew him into a position where he should have been, right? But that never happened. So... Right. And why didn't he burn up? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, because they, obviously there's right. not enough friction there. So, yeah, because obviously you're going other... you're going from a place where there is no friction. You're falling at you know crazy speeds, and then you're going to drastically slow down when you hit that atmosphere. And I thought that's the point where uh, you should disintegrate or burn up. Or I mean, I'm sure, he wasn't wearing a protective suit like the Soyuz or something. Yeah, and I was yeah. just going to add, and in this fact, he's would have to the balloon has to increase its speed in order to keep up with the ground below it. So. How in the world can that happen when there's hardly any air up there? So the balloon yeah, has to increase speed, and then when he falls, he has to decrease speed to ma to to match up back up with the Earth. And if they're going to, you know, claim inertia or whatever it is that they're going to try to come up with, well, how can then they in the same breath say, well, a sniper accounts for the curvature, uh, the rotation on the Earth? I mean, the the, the two are mutually exclusive. Right. If the atmosphere is supposed to be carrying that around, at some point it needs to stop. At some point there's nothing else to carry. Yet, supposedly this thing's still moving along with it, 
yeah, and I think that their excuse for that would be inertia, which, uh, again, nobody can even explain really what inertia is. Right. Well, and not only that, when you when you go back to the Einsteinian, you know, definition and the way physics, uh, it does not work in a rotational frame of reference. Only a linear frame of reference does this inertia, and and so that's why they will use. Uh, you know, somebody going down the street on a big truck, right? And they're throwing a ball back and forth. And yeah, when you throw the ball in that linear frame of reference, it does, it picks up that, that inertia and goes with it. But they tell you point blank, it does not work in a rotational frame of reference. Therefore, all bets are off, right? Doesn't make, it doesn't work. Right. It's crazy. <laughs> all right. So, all right, let's go, let's continue on with uh, Rob Skiba here, and then we'll hit some more of these documents. Here we go. Another declassified CIA document up here, right? They're checking out the firmament in this one. Let's go back to Acrobat. 1953 now. Geophysics light scattering, USSR. I'm trying to figure out how does light work in the atmosphere here. So we get down to page 19 here. It says, Dissertations defended in the Scientific Council of the Institute of Physics of the Earth. Institute of Physics of the Atmosphere and Institute of Applied Geophysics, USSR, 1957. March 1957, looks like March 23, 1957, apparently. The dissertation represents the result of many years of study of the clear daytime sky. The observations were carried out in 12 locations at various altitudes above the sea, various climatic, meteorological, and synoptic conditions. The observations were carried out mainly during high transparency of the atmosphere in the visual range of the spectrum in the absence of a snow cover. In the investigations, two instruments designed by V.G. Fezenkov were used. One of these was a visual photometer of the daytime sky intended for measuring the brightness of the firmament. Hmm. Interesting. Trying to figure out the brightness of the firmament. Again, 1957. The dissertation contains a certain formula of the brightness of the sky, taking into consideration only the brightness of the first order, and derived, get this now, on the assumption of a flat earth, and giving some conclusions derived on the basis of this formula. So the Russians are trying to check out the firmament based on assumptions of a flat earth in 1957? Very interesting, huh? <laughs> Very interesting <laughs> indeed. Okay, so is that something that uh, they're just approximating Globers? Um, they're approximating a firmament? Or is that something that's real? Well, what other, what other evidence do we have for a, uh, or, or I should say, potential evidence, whatever, however you want to look at it. Um, we have things like uh, Werner von Braun's headstone, you got to love that, where he quotes Psalms 19.1. Um, which talks about the firmament, right? Um, and, you know, beyond that, you know, I have made the case several times before that, um, yes, I'm a domer. I, I believe that there is a dome, and there are several reasons why I believe there's a dome. Uh, and it's certainly not because I'm religious, because I'm not, but I'm just simply looking at the, the facts here. And what I see is, you know, we, we live uh, in an earth where, you know, contrary to some popular opinions that are going out, on out there, which completely are beyond me, um, we live in a pressurized system. There is pressure, right? Uh, whether you want to call it 14.7 PSI or 760 Tor or whatever, we are in a pressurized system, and that pressure does reduce as it goes up, right? Well, so the Globers say, well, it, that's because um, the gravity is holding it, right? Uh, yeah, okay, maybe, but that, that certainly... The, the problem with that is that these, this weak, weak gravitational force could not possibly overcome um, the incredible power of the 10 to the negative 17th Tor vacuum. And I know you guys have probably heard this over and over and over again, beat to death in the whole nine yards. But, you know, few people really will really expand on that thinking. So um, we pretty much eliminated the globe side of it. But let's look at the flatter side of it. Okay, so... If we have a firmament, as the Russian document seems to be saying here, and many other things, um, then what is it? We have a container, right? You have to have a container to have a pressurized system, right? So 
few people address the, you know, everybody wants to talk about the, the vertical containment, but few people ever talk about the lateral containment of the pressure, right? What is holding the air in on the sides, people, right? It's not just running out, you know, to, you know, somewhere else. It's got to be pressurized. There must be a container, which tells me that in all likelihood, there is a dome above us. What else do we have that kind of indicates that we might have a dome above us? Well, let's look at the so-called 24-hour sunlight in Antarctica, right? Now, the Globers would love to have us believe, you know, and they, they always come up with these ridiculous um, fake 24-hour um, surveillance films from Antarctica, and we talked about this so many times before, where they will cut eight to 10 hours out, and of course their excuse is, well, uh, we don't have the bandwidth to, to share all that, right? <laughs> of course. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, when you wrote those letters back and forth to those people, Jaron, I was dying. It's like, what, what kind of a lame excuse is that, right? I gotta say, Jaron, that was one of the best finds ever. I just love that. Yeah, it's and it's and it's still up there. You still can go there and see that they they that's their only representation, and it would be so easy to show us uh, rather than eight hours a day, just show us a month or show us, you know, two, but they say, Oh no, we don't have enough bandwidth. The satellite only passes by for <laughs> a certain amount of time, even though we've got, you know, uh, supposedly, you know, thousands of satellites up there. They, they haven't learned to bounce that off there, I guess. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> so, so, okay. So anyway, so getting back to this, so why, why, you know, why would they make up such ridiculous excuse? Why can't we have, one, you know, or we should have billions of these things, honestly. We should have so many uh, documented, especially with the controversy going around. You would think that the government would go out of their way to appease these people saying, because, you know, that alone, showing something as simple as an unaltered, you know, footage of, of a 24-hour sunshine, you know, let's say on December 21st in Antarctica, would pretty much put it away, right? It'd be over goodbye, flat earth, you know, game over, say goodnight. But that doesn't happen. And in fact, you know, all we're getting is obfuscations about it, ridiculous excuses, uh, phony CGI composites of people trying to convince us. Um, so what's the deal? Well, a lot of people that have been down there say, well, yeah, the, it, it does stay light all night long. Well, yeah, well, sunlight and sunshine are two very different things. Now, Many of you may remember a video that Jaron did um, a while back about something called a coffee cup caustic, okay? And essentially, they, there's even a tool for this, Jaron. I, I don't have that handy to pull up or anything like that. But the coffee cup caustic, uh, the, the tool essentially shows that if you have a point source light, okay, and you have some sort of a light reflecting field, right, that goes around it like a coffee cup, right? That's why it's called a coffee cup caustic. Um, what will happen is that light will actually kind of bend around the outside of the coffee cup and illuminate all around. Now, if Antarctica is truly surrounding us all the way around, like in the flat earth model, and we believe that it is, then this is a beautiful explanation for the 24 hour sunlight, you know, when the sun is in a specific position, right? So that's something that, that I think people really need to consider. And so let's start putting these pieces together, right? This is why I believe there's a dome. And, and, you know, I may be wrong, but I'm simply looking at the evidence, but it seems like the biblical, you know, not only the biblical uh, account of the earth topology and, you know, its, its overall nature seems to be pretty accurate. And it's not just the, the biblical the, uh, depiction of it either. It, it's like, Virtually every civilization on Earth has depicted a flat, stationary Earth with some sort of a dome that contains the stars and the sun and all of that stuff in it, right? Uh, you, you, even if you're not a religious person, you cannot discount the, the volumes of evidence that I believe that there are to show this, right? So we have air pressure. We have coffee cup caustics. We have... Um, you know, the things you have to consider. We have these government documents that are saying straight up. Um, and also, uh, in other places in this particular document, um, it talks about the light measurements from the bottom of the sky, uh, meaning, 
uh, that could very easily be interpreted as the bottom of the firmament, right? And that's something that I'm not going to go, go in today, but it, it is covered. And there are several inferences in there that there absolutely is some sort of a solid, uh, transparent type of thing that's described in the Bible called a firmament. It just, just is, okay? So, okay, so let's continue on with this. And uh, we will uh, see what else Rob has to say here. Here we go. All right, let's uh, see what NASA has to say. Looking at this ntrs.nasa.gov document here, dated April 17th, 1961. Go back to Acrobat. Looking at this document from 1961. And it says, A trajectory simulation incorporating the above requirements is represented in Figure 8. In addition to the above requirements, this simulation assumes a vehicle with six degrees of freedom and aerodynamic symmetry in roll and the missile position in space is computed relative to a flat non-rotating Earth. So they're checking out missile position in space computed relative to a flat non-rotating Earth. Why would you do that? If the Earth is a rotating ball 25,000 miles in circumference, why would you do your computations based on a non-rotating flat Earth? <laughs> You're going to tell me that this simplifies the math? I mean, we are actually dealing with rocket scientists here. So math's not a problem for these people. All right, let's see what else we can find. Okay. So, you know, Rob obviously raises a huge point there. We are dealing with rocket trajectories, right? I'm sorry, Globers, but an approximation <laughs> is so ridiculous to even state um, when they are literally leaving um, you know, most of these rockets supposedly are going out of the atmosphere and then have a re-entry trajectory around a ball, right? And the ball is rotating at 15 degrees per hour or 1,040 miles an hour, which is huge. Um, you know, it probably just a little bit slower than the rocket is actually traveling itself. So how in the world could you possibly justify saying, well, it's an approximation that works well? There is no way that this approximation would work well because the difference of a spinning ball that's rotating at 1,040 miles an hour and the fact that it's a ball, um, you know, it, it, it doesn't even fit into this equation at all. So again, why would this document be classified? Why would it even be written at all? Because it makes absolutely no sense at all unless we are truly on a flat stationary Earth, right? You guys, any comments on that? I would just add again that I, I don't think whoever wrote this had any clue what to do or how to accomplish. You know, they just don't know what to do on how to, to identify this with mathematics on what effect the rotation of the Earth is going to have on a rocket launch because it's just there, there, is, there is none. They've never experienced it, and so they don't right. know what to even put down. Yeah. No, and that's. Ex oh, go no, ahead, totally agree. Sorry. No, I was just going to say I totally agree. I think that uh, it's why all their calculations are geocentric. It's the same kind of idea. Yes, exactly. And and again, like I said, people, common sense here. Why would these documents even exist? Um, why would they be classified? What's the big deal, right? We're we're talking about physics here, and physics that would be taught in any university, um, maybe even in high school. I don't know, but. Uh, this is not something that this information would need to be classified, let alone for dozens, uh, you know, for decades, right? So again, the, again, the the, com the response that the Globers give you of, well, it's a great approximation because it simplifies things is bullshit. It's simple as that. All right, let's continue on. Well, just one second. Um, one oh. thing I'm sorry. Uh, one thing I That's wanted okay. to add, though, is that everything that changed for me for flat earth was when I first saw the eight inches per mile squared. I did not believe that. I thought that was a sham. I thought, you know, flat earthers are lying, that there's no way that that's the, that's the correct calculation. And we're talking over, you know, visible distance of 500 miles or whatever. I know they'll lie about that one, but uh, that, that's, that's what did it for me. And I just want to add here is it's kind of the same thing. Eight inches per mile squared. If it was real, if that was really the curvature, 
shouldn't it be discussed in classrooms everywhere? I mean, wouldn't that be one of the most fascinating things to have a discussion for children of teaching them what the curvature of the earth actually is and that they could go out and maybe measure it and things like that? Nobody knows about it. I mean, I never heard of eight inches per mile squared in all my, my years of college. And I took geology. I got an A there. Nobody ever mentioned that. What about in surveying courses? Uh, I think uh, Chris Von Maitre, he said that he, he never heard of eight, in, eight inches per mile squared. How, how in the world did these things not – nobody talks about it. Why, why wasn't this discussed until Flat Earth came around? And the same here. Nobody knows how – I mean, I think that's one of the mistakes that they made is that because it's so easy to see that they lie there that they – that's why they have to avoid any discussion of it. Right. They don't even want to bring it up. They don't want you even looking into it or understanding that because the second you do and you go out and do an observation like you just did in your recent video or not you did, but you highlighted, uh, you know, the camera that was what six inches off the water, yeah. seeing a bridge, you know, nine and a half miles away, uh, completely destroys any heliocentric, uh, you know, curvature of earth, any eight inches per mile squared that simply isn't curvature. When, so if you if you give that to students and you tell them, oh, it's eight inches per mile squared, well, then they're going to go out and they're going to do some of these observations and then they're going to have a lot of questions. So if you just hide that, well, you don't have people going out and even wanting to observe. Yeah, and I think that's kind of the same thing where that's happening here is that they're hiding the fact that there's no rotation, that they, they can't make a calculation for it. So they just say, well, we got to assume that it's a, it's a flat and stationary Earth because they have no calculation to to adjust for it. And then you get people yes. asking the questions that we flat earthers ask about why are wind, you know, why are these wind gusts and these jet streams going faster than the spin of the earth? It, it doesn't even make sense. So they have to uh, just tell people you're spinning, the atmosphere is attached, and you, you know, since you were born here, you'll never realize that you're spinning or flying through space at, you know, 1.5 million miles per hour. Yeah, exactly. Ignore, ignore, ignore. Yes, always the excuse, always the incredible miraculous exception to the rule that's uh, utterly ridiculous you know if we and people just that, people just believe it i mean once you once you've taught everybody in school that there's these into you know intellectually superior people that have figured this all out uh if any in new information comes people just ignore it and they say no it's not possible i've already been taught how the world works i've already been taught i'm spinning on this rock in space and or just uh, by sheer chance, not hitting any of these asteroids that are coming towards us, and it's just ridiculous to me. <laughs> yep, amen to that. Okay, let's continue on. Take it away, Rob. That was April 1961. This is NASA.gov again. June 1971. So let's look at that one. June 1971, a method for reducing the sensitivity of optimal nonlinear systems to parameter uncertainty. Whatever that means. Actually, let's let's define what that means, okay? Just so you know. First of all, he's talking about a nonlinear system, okay? And we'll just go to Wikipedia for about it, okay? In mathematics and science, a nonlinear system is a system in which the change of the output is not proportional to the change of the input. Nonlinear problems are of interest to engineers, biologists, physicists, mathematicians, and many other scientists because most systems are inherently nonlinear in nature. So now let's see what is a parameter uncertainty, okay? This comes from the model parameters that are inputs of the computer model, mathematical model, but whose exact values are unknown to experimentalists. Hmm. Okay. <laughs> these, these are not values that should be, the exact value should not be unknown. There's a problem with that. And cannot be controlled in physical experiments. Well, that I can see. <laughs> uh, or whose values cannot be exactly inferred by a statistical method. Some examples are a local free fall acceleration uh, in a falling object uh, experiment various material properties in a finite element analysis for engineering and multiplier uncertainty in the context of macroeconomic policy optimization. All right, so now that we have covered that, now we can get back, whoops, wrong one, and let's look at the rest of it. Okay, so let's continue on, Rob. And we get down to about page 12 here, and it says... 
a numerical example problem statement. The example problem is a fixed time problem in which it is required to determine the thrust attitude program of a single stage rocket vehicle starting from rest and going to specified thermal conditions of altitude and vertical velocity which will maximize the final horizontal velocity. The idealizing assumptions made are the following. Number one, a point mass vehicle. Number two, of the idealized assumptions that are being made for this example is a flat non-rotating earth. NASA making idealized assumptions based on a flat non-rotating earth? What's going on here? Let's continue. Yes, what's going on indeed. And again, like I said, those variables <laughs> that they're using are, are supposed to be not only known but have been known for a long, long time. And um, so to make these assumptions for simplicity, guys, excuse me, I don't think so. That, that, does not, that does not work, and that excuse is a load of BS once again. So, all right, so let's move on. Here we go, Rob. Continue. Here we have another NASA.gov document dated March 1972. March 1972, NASA Technical Memorandum, determination of angles of attack and side slip from radar data and a roll stabilized platform. Gotta love the titles, huh? Okay, abstract. Equations for angles of attack and side slip relative to both a rolling and non-rolling body access system are derived for a flight vehicle for which radar and gyroscopic attitude data are available. The method is limited, however, to application where a flat non-rotating earth may be assumed. All right, let's continue. All right. Now, first of all, the reason that's a problem is we're talking about radar here, which is something that is live. <laughs> uh, and radar can, can track objects hundreds of miles away. And in some radars, they can track objects thousands of miles away. So to, to sit there and, and assert that it is necessary to base these equations on a flat, non-rotating, non-moving Earth for simplicity's sakes is utterly retarded. That, that does not work. You cannot... You cannot have things in motion, objects in the sky in motion, uh, the earth in motion. And, and guys, mind you, we have not even brought into this equation the earth's motion through space around the sun or the sun around the Milky Way or the Milky Way around the great attractor, on and on and on. All of these variables would make a difference. Now, of course, the Globers are going to come back and say, well, yeah, but everything is contained within our atmosphere and everything moves with it, which I think, as we just discussed a little while ago, no, that's not true um, because there is never any shearing effect ever that should be, you know, you should get shear effects that are hurricane force when you have vehicles re-entering, especially at the speed that they do. It should literally disintegrate things and not from the heat, but from the shearing forces. Okay, so let's continue on. Just one qu quick thing. I, I, I one time did an experiment. It, it kind of didn't work out, but uh, I attached my uh, globe I had with a, to my drill bit, stuck it in a pool and, and spun it up to, to show what it would, would happen. And it's, I mean, air does not stick to a globe. It doesn't stick to the ground. It would just swirl all around the, around the earth. How in the world did, can they claim that there's this bike spoke uh, bike spoke speed that the, the 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 atmosphere somehow sticks to the to the to the globe where all of it acts in this uniform mass that swirls around with the, with the ground below it. It's just it makes zero sense. There's no sense there whatsoever. Yeah, absolutely true. But you know, again, this is why we try to appeal to people's common sense because if you follow the mainstream horse hockey, um, they will tell you that oh no, all of this is actually happening. You just don't detect it. Uh huh. Yeah, okay. Not, not only do you not detect it, but none of our instruments do either. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, go ahead. Continue on, Rob. That was 1972, the end of the, or right around the end of the Apollo program. So we go to NASA again, NASA.gov, December 1978. 
Investigation of aircraft landing in variable wind fields. <laughs> Equations of motion. This comes up a lot. The two-dimensional model for aircraft motion presented in this section follows the general form developed by Frost. It accounts for both vertical and horizontal mean wind components having both time and spatial variations. The aircraft trajectory model employed in this study was derived based on the following assumptions. Number one, the Earth is flat and not rotating. That's the number one assumption? <laughs> <laughs> so we, we're going to see this over assumption. and over and over again regarding the <laughs> equations of motion. They're always using it on a flat, non-rotating Earth model. Which doesn't make sense if you're... Okay, and before we... Let me cut over to this. So let me show you this document, which uh, he just showed this. Uh, the following assumptions, the Earth is flat and non-rotating, and one other place that this showed up um, is right here. Ramifications of the air, this is the same document, by the way. Ramifications of the airplane motion due to the effects of temporarily, temporarily, excuse me, and spatially varying means winds are studied in this report. Analysis of flight paths through changing mean wind fields reported in the literature are primarily two dimensional and deal only with vertically varying horizontal winds. Well, you, you would think that. Uh, <laughs> that you would also have to take that curvature of, you know, one degree of every uh, 69 miles into effect also. In other words, i.e. having a component parallel to the flat Earth only. Yikes. It just keeps coming. So, all right, let's kick back over to Rob here and uh, move on. Developing aircraft and missiles and things like that to, f to go over a rotating ball. Why would you start off with the assumption of a non-rotating flat Earth? if the real world application is a, is over a spinning ball 1987 NASA technical paper 2768 user's manual for linear a fortran program to derive linear aircraft models get that an acrobat here same document and we'll scroll down to i believe it was page 12 again Program overview. Within the program, the nonlinear equations of motion include 12 states representing a rigid aircraft flying in a stationary atmosphere over a flat, non rotating Earth. More diagrams, more equations. The nonlinear equations of motion used in the linearization program are general six degree of freedom equations representing the flight dynamics of a rigid aircraft flying in a stationary atmosphere over a flat, non-rotating Earth. <laughs> Let's continue. Always, always. That was 1987. NASA.gov, May 1988. Flight testing. Flight testing a V-stole aircraft to identify a full envelope aerodynamic model. Okay, just to clarify what this means, the V-stall v means vertical or short takeoff and landing. Um, so in other words, vertical obviously would be something like a Harrier jump jet or a helicopter. Uh, short takeoff and landing, they have several craft that will pop off the ground really quick. Um, uh, you know, very, very short runways required and they, they come right off. So that's what V-stall means. So continue on. June 27, 1988 day after my birthday. Page four of their document. For aircraft problems, the state of measurement models together represent the kinematics of a rigid body for describing motion over a flat, non-rotating Earth. All right. NASA.gov, December. Okay. Uh, oh, yep, that's right. Let's continue. Number 1991. Aircraft model for the AIAA Controls Design Challenge. On page 11. Once again, you have the equations of motion and atmospheric model. The nonlinear equations of motion used in this model are general six degree of freedom equations representing the flight dynamics of a rigid aircraft flying in a stationary atmosphere over, over a flat, non rotating Earth. So you guys start to see a pattern here? I sure am. NASA.gov, June <laughs> 1997. 
talking about the SR-71. Predicted performance of a thrust-enhanced SR-71 aircraft with an external payload. One of my favorite aircraft of all time. That's just a cool-looking airplane, huh? Let's see what they have to say about a back-mounted hypersonic research vehicle sitting on top of the SR-71. That's pretty crazy. Pretty cool interior shot right here. And on page 8, Digital Performance Simulation Description. The digital performance simulation equations of motion use four assumptions that simplify the program while maintaining its fidelity for most maneuvers and applications. Number one, point mass modeling. Two, non-turbulent atmosphere. Three, zero side forces. And four, a non-rotating Earth. Now, they don't, they don't specify flat here, but they're saying the Earth's not rotating as part of their four assumptions that simplify the program while maintaining its fidelity. So they're discrediting the rotating Earth right here, at least by that statement, it would appear. Moving right along. We come to another NASA document. I wasn't able to figure out what year this was from, but it's a, it's definitely a NASA document here. I'm guessing sometime around 1997, as, or sometime shortly thereafter, as the footnotes indicate anyway. There are footnotes that go to 1997. They don't go any later than that. Singular Arc Optimal Control. Our Minimum Time to Climb Problem. In our minimum time to climb problem, the aircraft is modeled as a point mass and the flight trajectory is strictly confined in a vertical plane on a non-rotating flat Earth. Okay, now guys, you also have to remember that, you know, as an aircraft climbs, it is entering into a thinner and thinner part of the atmosphere, which would mean that the influence of the alleged rotating atmosphere would become less and less prevalent and apparent on that aircraft. So that seems to me, again, that <laughs> assuming a non-rotating Earth is a problem because, you know, when you're, when you are going up with some of these aircraft, SR-71, whatever, to, you know, as high as 80,000 feet in some cases, maybe even higher, um, that is going to become a very significant factor. But what do I know? Let's continue on. Aren't, aren't all of the flight simulators, aren't they always assuming a flat and stationary Earth, too? Always, 100% of the time. Yep. Even, even the flight simulators that you take in real flight school, the ones that they have now, which are amazing, by the way, um, if you check those out, they're incredible. But yes, uh, absolutely, they're based on a flat, non-rotating Earth, um, and all the physics on them work absolutely perfect. And we'll just fast forward to the end here. See, it's uh, the dates there. The latest one is 1997. So that's where I came to that conclusion. 2000 Army Research Laboratory. This is ARL.Army.Mil document here. Path loss measurements in a forested environment at VHF. Let's check that one out. Under data analysis on page 10 of their document here, multipath data. In this section, we discuss the data for the measurements described in section 2.2, figure 9, plots the transmission loss as a function of transmit antenna height for 145, 223, 300, 435, and 910 megahertz, respectively. The received antenna height was 2.7 meters, and the range was 410 meters for all frequencies except 435 megahertz where the receive height was 3.6 meters and the range was 200 meters. The expected transmission loss in decibels over a flat Earth is given by the following equation. Okay, now one thing I want to point out about this um, is, now this is crazy, because this is, what they're looking at here is the path loss measurements, right? And you've heard about me, you've heard me talk about this before. There is an inverse square law Okay, and the path loss means that as you're going along the path, that um, assuming no interference, uh, in this case they're they're doing it through uh, forested environment, um, it's going to that signal can be expected to decrease uh, commensurate with the inverse square law. Okay, 
great. But now we're looking at multipath data. And I have to remind everyone, when, when microwave paths are computed and they compute the Fresnel zone, right? The Fresnel zone is never, uh, t has never taken into uh, account a, a, an earth that is falling away from the source point at eight inches per mile squared. And like I said, you know, when you go 100 to 200 miles, right, you're talking anywhere from a mile to three miles of drop off that should be considered in a multi-path multi or Fresnel zone calculation. It is not. It never has been. It never will be. Why? Because there is no curvature to the Earth. Uh, otherwise, that would absolutely be a very significant factor to this. But and what they're looking at here is they want to know, okay, they want to know something realistic. They're saying, okay, so if it's forested, so if we have troops uh, in an area like Vietnam or something, it's heavily forested, and we want to know how much the um, path is going to be attenuated, the signal is going to be attenuated as a result of having to go through the trees and the foliage and stuff like that. Well, this is a very, very uh, valid test. However, it loses its validity almost immediately within a few miles because all of a sudden, you know, you're 10 miles away and now you're looking at a 66 foot uh, curvature drop, which is, you know, maybe around the height of an average tree, right? So what's going on here? But they're not making that assumption. They're not even calculating or figuring that in, right? So <laughs> again, they're looking at this purely based on what's happening as it goes through the foliage. They are not, because frankly, after 10 miles, it shouldn't matter anymore because you're gonna be out of that foliage if you don't start off there in the first place, right? So I just wanted to point that out. So let's continue on. We get down to page 14 here. HH propagation through the woods and taking the HH polarization propag... Okay, now let me clarify what HH means. HH means horizontal, horizontal, transmit, receive, polarization. You also have HV, horizontal, vertical, VV, vertical, vertical, uh, uh, type of uh, propagation and also determining what type of antenna polarization you actually need to use. So that's what the HH means. So let's continue. Propagation data through woods, both in winter and summer, we observed local fluctuations up to 20 decibels. We avoided these large dips in receive power by minor repositioning of the receive antenna. It is important to note, however, that the multipath from the local trees and brush can cause such variations. After the data were inspected, it became apparent that they tended to agree with the theory given by equation two plus some fixed attenuation and therefore allowed us to develop an analytical expression based on flat earth theory. Gee, I wonder why. <laughs> oh, you gotta love these documents. Yeah, approximation globers, give me a break. Let's continue. I'll read that again. It therefore allowed us to develop an analytical expression based on flat earth theory. So everybody who wants to label us flat earthers crazy must have to uh, lump in the Army Research Laboratory as part of the Looney Tune bin. Let's see what else they have to say. Okay, and before we do that, let's cut over to this. So here we go. Um, all right, so if we look through these path loss measurements, we find uh, things like here it is in the figures, comparison of measurements to theory for transmission loss over a flat earth uh, for a range of 410 megahertz and receive antenna uh, a height of 2.7 meters uh, for 145, 223, 300, 435, and 910. So they're, they're obviously testing this at multiple frequencies because each frequency will respond slightly differently. And typically, the lower the frequency, the more tolerance there will be uh, for passing through the foliage. And as you get up towards the higher frequencies, that's when you're going to get into multipath problems because it goes bouncing all over the place. So next thing up on this, uh, comparison of a measured propagation loss over flat Earth and an analytical model for horizontal, horizontal polarization in decibels plotted as a function of range for all of these different frequencies again <laughs> flat earth and and guys the the fall off of the eight inches per mile squared is an absolutely significant factor uh, for this it, it just it just is there's no way around it uh, next up uh, let's see we've got we included propagation measurements in a relatively flat clearing okay uh, use these trees 
Okay, that doesn't really mean a whole lot because, yeah, uh, that, would, that would be good. Uh, let's see. Okay, we made multipath measurements to provide confidence in the data and to get an idea of how well our measurements of the clearing represented an ideal flat Earth. Well, it measures it. It, it is an, an exact match to an ideal flat Earth is uh, essentially what comes up on this. Uh, another one. The expected transmission loss in decibels over a flat Earth is given by, and lo and behold, just like I said, obeying the inverse square law, that is exactly what comes up. Again, comparison of measurements to theory for transmission loss over a flat Earth for a range, all this. Again, why, why people, why are they doing this based on a flat Earth when especially transmission, you have got to deal with those uh, curvature variables. They make a huge difference, not only for Fresnel calculations, multipath calculations, um, but also, you know, any type of attenuation that would occur from the ground level. But as soon as you get far enough away from that transmission area, well, then the earth has fallen away from that transmission point and nothing else even matters at that point, right? So we just keep going on over and over and over and over in this document is based nothing but on flat earth theory and you know they never mention not even one time and believe me i spent the time to read through these documents they don't ever um come they don't ever consider what it would be like considering the actual curvature right it's just not factored in and yet for some reason these things which should be obvious and are available to any rf engineer um why is it classified unless they don't want people to know that the government is looking at a flat earth, right? Simple as that. All right, let's go back to Rob. A propagation of electromagnetic fields over the flat earth. What? <laughs> Army Research what? Laboratory, ARL.Army. But it's just an approximation, right? <laughs> right. Mill by Joseph R. Melita, February 2001. Propagation of electromagnetic fields over flat Earth. You guys seeing that? Check it out. There it is again. In the table of contents, figures 6 and 7, comparison of principal fields from an ideal dipole oriented perpendicular and horizontal to a homogeneous flat Earth. Figure 7, comparison of principal fields from an ideal dipole oriented perpendicular and horizontal to a homogeneous flat Earth. There are the two figures, figure six, figure seven, over flat earth. Army Research Laboratory. Mm. Back to NASA, nasa.gov, June 2002. Stability and control estimation. Okay, and honestly, for time consideration, guys, I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop it here because we're running into the same thing over and over and over again, whether whether they're doing it with RF, whether they're doing it for flight dynamics, whether they're doing it for rocket flights. The only thing that is ever considered is a flat, non-rotating stationary Earth with a firmament. Now, why is that? You know, I mean, it, I would love to hear what the Globers are going to come up with after this. You guys have any, you guys want to take any bets on what they're going to say? <laughs> It's getting, you know, every time I, I put out a video, it's always that magical refraction properties that automatically create the illusion of a flat earth. And, uh, right. you know, the ionosphere, everything automatically adjusts like a, uh, the, the uh, pen, uh, I'm sorry, not the pendulum, but the uh, gyroscope, for example, they'll say is automatically adjusted by, by gravity. They'll say, for example, uh, an airplane nose is automatically adjusted. I don't know what the, the, the official reason is now, but I think they say gravity or air pressure. Everything's automatically adjusted by nature to create a, the illusion of a flat earth. And so I guess what they would say is they need to rewrite their articles to say, uh, you know, well, everything's fixed by refraction. Everything's created flat by refraction or or electrical ducting or whatever it is that they want to call it. And it just so happens it all works on a flat, non-rotating earth. <laughs> yes. Perfectly. <laughs> Perfectly. They, they can invent whatever they need to justify it. Right. And yep. people are going to believe it. I mean, at this point, they've already convinced people that they're right about everything. So somebody can just come along and say whatever. They can just say refraction, even though it makes no sense. And looming, super looming, 
And people all of a sudden think that's an excuse for why we see things too, too far, why we see too far. Oh, that's looming. Uh, you know, you can look at Kanagu Mountain when the sun sets behind it. You can know that that's 175 miles. You can know the observer's height. And yet people will just use the excuse of, oh, it's refraction. You're actually seeing beyond that because for some reason the sun, I guess it's the sun that does it, lifts up this mountaintop and allows you to see it over the curve. It makes no sense in the world. But uh, again, people are going to believe it because it helps reconfirm their belief that the Earth's a sphere. Yes. Yep. So anyway, so yeah, lots of that stuff. So I want to kind of go back and touch on the firmament thing, because there's a couple of things that I, I kind of omitted on that. I, I gave you, you know, some of my reasons why I believe that, that we're in a domed earth with the firmament. Um, here's another one, and this this is really amazing. This was uh, done uh, by Nova, which is PBS series. Um, and I'm not going to play it because they are, they will strike on this for sure. But um, essentially what it's about is sprites and elves and how they have managed to get um, these shots of them, which is very interesting. So what, you know, I, you've, you guys have heard me say many times before that, that if there was a lower limit to the firmament, um, I've always speculated that it's probably at around uh, 100 kilometers or around 60, 66 miles, something like that, okay? So lo and behold, when you start looking at this, uh, they are studying these uh, sprites and elves. And what they find is, is that, first of all, what they are is they are vertically discharging lightning, right? Well, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense that the lightning would be discharging upwards, especially under the current theory of how lightning works, right? Because supposedly the, the uh, electrostatics is generated by the, the cold and warm air currents that are passing each other, uh, causing a friction, causing electrostatics. And then, it, of course, it is naturally discharged to the Earth because the Earth is at ground potential. But what, what some of the pilots started uh, reporting, and this documentary is fa fascinating, even though it's 99% BS on how they arrived at it. But what's, what I found interesting is, is what they discovered of, of where they're hitting and how this all comes about. Other than that, it's a complete NASA propaganda piece. But so what they have found out that they have these vertical discharges that are going up from the clouds, which makes no sense whatsoever because there will only be a current flow when there is another conductor or another terminal, if you will, another pole um, that is of sufficient difference of potential to allow a discharge upwards, right? So in the standard globe earth model, it doesn't really make a whole lot of, of sense. But what's really interesting about this is that when these upward discharges occur, they are occurring at an altitude of about 100 kilometers, which, you know, again, if you've heard me talk about my, my idea of this electric earth, um, that you, the earth is the kind of the cathode and the firmament would be the anode. You have to have a charge potential. We know by Richard Feynman that there is a static potential charge of 100 volts per meter that's been, you know, measured all the way up to something like, I don't know, 50 miles or whatever it was, right? Uh, so, which gives us a static potential of 5 million volts. And they're saying, obviously, that it's even higher than that with these sprites. So, again, what's going on here? How are we having a current flow or an upward strike into allegedly empty space? And they're not, there isn't even enough at these altitudes, at 66 miles up, there isn't even enough atmosphere up there to cause any type of uh, friction between air currents, right? It just, it's just not there. And yet they flatten out at the top just like they were hitting something. Gee, I wonder what they're hitting. But they're doing that. So again, this is another one of those pieces of evidence that you really have to consider and, and set aside their BS explanation for it. Because if you know even the most basic things about electricity, there has to be a static difference of potential or some sort of a cathode, anode, or terminals with, with a high enough potential difference that there will cause a current flow. Without that, forget about it. It isn't going to work. So what else do we have to indicate that there may be a firmament? Well, here's another thing that I have pointed out several times. The Star Trek-like invisible shield found thousands of miles above Earth. Well, first of all, thousands of miles, uh, I'm saying, they're saying 7,200 miles. Now, 
I don't believe that that is the case at all. I think it's much, much closer, but you also have to understand that when it comes to scaling in the universe, uh, because of the scales that we are given in general, we seem to be off by a factor of about ooh, 10 to the 120th, right? Okay, so, uh, or up to that. <laughs> so, but it's interesting. But they say stuff like, it's almost like these electrons are running into a glass wall in space, said Baker, the study's lead author, somewhat like the shields created by the force fields on Star Trek that were used to repel alien weapons. We are seeing an invisible shield blocking these electrons. It's an extremely puzzling phenomenon. Well, yes, I'm sure it is. Um, <laughs> because there's something up there, again, in my opinion. But again, there is so much evidence, I think, that build, we're building this preponderance of evidence once again, that uh, I, this is really kind of leaning towards the idea that there is a firmament, uh, no matter Do you have an you idea of what that firmament would be composed of? Are you, are you saying it's like a, an electrical thing or actually a solid thing? Well, I think, I think that it's probably a solid thing, but it has a charge potential on it. Um, and, uh, and, you know, I think that there's probably uh, a few, and it also has optical characteristics as well. And I think that, that if, if the biblical account of, you know, where the sun and the moon are within the firmament, right, that's also something I believe that could be giving us our apparent position of the sun and moon. Uh, because obviously they're very elusive, like a rainbow. You know, you, you go towards them and they seem to move away from you. You can't ever really track them down, right? Right. Uh, so... I don't know, but I, I tend to think that, yes, it is solid, uh, just biblical account, and I think that it uh, is giving us both a charge potential and also an optical effect. But again, this is my opinion. You know, I could be crazy. So <laughs> there you have it. So um, that that pretty much is about it that I, you know, all I wanted to say about that, we're running, we definitely ran out of time. I wanted to keep these shows shorter. Um, I do want to, uh, actually, I'm going to cover this next week, um, but uh, uh, Zach Good Times for All did a video that is really cool, um, guys, and you know how I've been talking about change the charge potential, you change the effect of so-called gravity because I believe it's an electrical phenomenon, but uh, what Zach has done in this video, and I will put it in the show notes and we will cover it probably next week, is he put a an object, uh, charged object on top of a scale and he fired up his... Um, uh, uh, Van der Graaff generator, put a, a high static potential charge on it, and it changed the weight dramatically of this object. Um, again, this will be in the show notes, and we will uh, go into it in more detail. But uh, yeah, it's it's pretty freaking amazing uh, what he did. And this is all, you know, based on what I've been saying about charge potential. Also, you guys may remember the uh, uh, spider ballooning uh, and also NASA talking about tethering. Again, it's all about changing the charge potential, which changes this, this so-called gravimetric effect, because I believe it's electrical, you know, whatever it is. So it's, a, it's some sort of, and Ken Wheeler would agree with that. Uh, it's just he has a different way of, of going about it. So I uh, wanted to give that a shout out, and we will be going into that. Another thing I didn't cover today is an amazing thing David Weiss threw in, unbelievably stunning find in Brazilian rainforest, duplicate Pentagon courtyard. Uh, Darren, did you watch this by any chance? I have not. Oh, my God. Absolutely mind-blowing. So this Pentagon uh, was found in an area that used to be an old, uh, I think, Air Force or missile base, something like that, down in South America in Brazil. And it just so happens that this clearing, which just appeared, literally just appeared this year, uh, matches precisely 1,666 feet around this perimeter, which is identical to the courtyard of the Pentagon, right? Right. And this, of course, deserves a whole lot more discussion. Wow. We'll uh, try and cover that next week. Mind-blowing. I'll put it in the uh, show notes. Florida Marquis is the guy that did this. Bizarre. Absolutely bizarre. I love stuff like this. Uh, okay. Other thing I want to... And, and, and Bob. Oh, yeah. You know, talking about Brazil, uh, why we never uh, use the ISS live feed to check, you know, the big events like, for example, the fires in the Amazon uh, zone, you know? Exactly. You, you, never, you, never, you never see that kind of a live uh, event. 
That's right. Well, and the one time that they did try to show that live event was uh, that hurricane. Um, I can't remember which hurricane it was, but it was several months back, and we actually covered it on Globusters. Um, but it was completely wrong uh, for the time indexes and what was being shown. In fact, it's funny because the ISS just seemed to stay there for the longest time, right? And it's supposedly going around the Earth once every 90 minutes. And so they just obviously fabricated this in. So, yeah, it's pretty bad, but you're right. Other than that, they don't ever show the ISS because there's no oh. way they could keep that data up. Go ahead, Ben. Or Rio. No. No, I mean, in fact, if you type uh, NASA jo uh, shows um, the Amazon fire, uh, um, carbon dioxide, um, you know, uh, uh, statistics, uh, they show. They show a, a CGI, you know, a telemetry data uh, applied onto uh, a CGI ball. But <laughs> it's just, you know, uh, a simulation that uh, you can see in the area of Brazil, Argentina and, and Paraguay. Uh, you know, spraying, spreading uh, red dots. You know, moving right. like okay, this is our the, the the fire and the and you say, man, even one satellite take uh, a live a live feed from the uh, Amazon fire. We are talking right now; it's still burning, and we are talking about uh, hundreds of hundreds of uh, um, square miles burning right now. And nobody can show the column of fire or the column of smoke. <laughs> no, but on the news, they do say, uh, and by the way, these fires are so big, they can be seen from the ISS in space. And then they show a fake CGI graphic with little red dots on it. Like, what? That's not seeing anything from space. That's somebody seeing it from their computer, drawing it on paint shop. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, it's a good question, Eero. And, you know, also, it doesn't... You, Jaron and I have gone outside many times during the alleged ISS Passovers, where we do see some sort of object in the sky, but, you know, we've covered that many times before. But ironically, whenever it's going over the United States, it's always cloud cover, even though it's a perfectly clear day here. And, you know, the satellite, or excuse me, the radar, uh, the ground radar shows clear skies all over the place. The ISS always shows uh, cloud cover everywhere. And if you don't believe us, try it yourself. You will be amazed. It's just fraud, straight up. So, okay. So, one last thing. I want to play a promo for uh, Karen B's uh, Flattoberfest, uh, and then I think we'll call it a show. But uh, this is coming up October 20th. Um, I will be there. Rob Skiba is a keynote uh, presenter. Mark Sargent, uh, Karen B, uh, uh, Just Jack, Flat Earth, and uh, several other people, and there's some musical talent and everything that's going on there. So I'm going to play this promo because I know uh, Karen would love for me to do that. And uh, then we'll call it a show. So here we go, guys. Uh, the Flattober Fest promo. It's that time. Summer is coming to an end. And here in the South, we can finally get some relief from the heat and humidity. It's harvest time. And along with it is the conference season. But hey, have you heard? There's a new addition to the regular conferences we see every year. This one is smaller, more affordable, and a little bit different than the others. Introducing Flattoberfest, being held at the Firmament in Greenville, South Carolina on October 20th, 2019. With Bob Nodell from Globebusters and Mark Sargent, creator of the Flat Earth Clues. Joshua Swift of Authentic Intent and keynote speaker Rob Skiba, an award-winning documentary filmmaker and best-selling author of several books and creator of TestingTheGlobe.com. We will also have two Flat Earth musical groups performing. One Big Love. Like share a bear, see you around. Like share a bear, it's going down. Like share a bear, we going up and down like Chevy, baby. Push your butt like Chevy, baby. Don't push holes like Chevy, baby. Too tight like Chevy, baby. Twin Serpent. We're addicted to our own limitations. We're only feeding in the zoo of vibration. Wandering the static of distorted frequency. Oscillating currents of a rhapsodic
The Firmament has a pizza kitchen and a full bar inside, but alternate dining choices are right across the street. Hotel and restaurants are within walking distance of the venue. The Firmament boasts a unique high-quality sound system and a full-color LED screen for visuals. This event is hosted by myself, Karen B., and Just Jack Flat Earth. We hope to see you there! You can also visit flattoberfest.com for details. All right, there we have it. And thank you for putting that on, Karen and Jack. So, and also in addition to that, we have the uh, Flat Earth International Conference coming up uh, in November. Uh, make sure you get your tickets for that. Uh, yeah, several people will be there. Uh, of course, the Globusters will be there, Jaron, Iru, myself, and uh, hopefully, hopefully Ben will be. Uh, ben, are you planning on making that? I hope so. I hope so. I'm going to the, uh, the Romanian uh, Flat Earth Conference there in October. I hope I can make this one in November as well. Okay, well, uh, you uh, you realize that uh, your your hotel room and, and your admission is free because you're a Globebuster. <laughs> hey, that's even a better deal. <laughs> hey, hey, right? Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, there are perks. There are perks. So <laughs> that's very cool. And then also, uh, Jaren's going to be coming uh, up in the Amsterdam conference. And uh, uh, I guess that's in September, right? Next month? Yeah, just about a month away, September 27th, 28th, 29th. I think the main day is the 28th, the Saturday, and then kind of an informal party Friday night and a um, some street activism with the Globe Light Tour will be on Sunday. All right, beautiful. Okay, so I guess we will call that a show then uh, today, guys. Um, hope you enjoyed it, our uh, return season. And uh, we're going to have lots more fun stuff like that. And uh, as always, I always over-prepare and have much more stuff to show than, but uh, I am going to try and keep them down, even shorter than this. Today ran long, but it was our season opener, so uh, cut me some slack. <laughs> all right. So, uh, all right. So, Ben, um, do you, we'll go ahead and uh, go around one more time, and we'll start with you. And uh, you want to let anybody know what's coming up or what's uh, going on with you? Oh, I don't, I don't, I'm going to, I am going to be working on, on starting the, the Globusters pro show. Um, that will be, uh, oh, kind of continuing right. I the, about that. I, I, I don't want to get into it, but I'll, I'll make a video about it. But, uh, what I'm hoping to do is, uh, start, continue the professional series that Mark Sargent has already done. He's done a great job. I'm not trying to take anything away from him, but I think, uh, we need to get more professionals coming out and, uh, we'll also get them a, a one-year membership to FE Core. So it'll be a great program. I think this will be awesome. It was just, uh, I'll, I'll make a video about it, though. Yes, I think it's a good absolutely. idea, and we can talk about that next week, Bob, because I think that's an awesome idea, and we'll be looking forward to that going forward. All right, beautiful. Yeah, I, I totally forgot about it. I get so wrapped up in this, and, you know, we always run along. That's because Eero talks so much and has so many screen <laughs> shares. So it's just Damn, Eero. I know. So what are we going to do with that guy? So, okay, Ira, are you still with us? Yes? <laughs> yeah, man, I, I'm still here. I don't like when people make jokes uh, about me. I like make jokes about you, but, <laughs> not, <laughs> but that, that, that's okay. Uh, no, no, um, here in Argentina, well, I, I'm starting to have a few nice uh, television interviews that uh, I'm starting, you know, taking more seriously the, the subject, the topic of the, of the flat earth. And uh, maybe, no, maybe not. This Friday that it's coming, I'm going to be in the university uh, making a, like a debate show, but uh, in the format of uh, television. It's a university that teach uh, about TV production and things like that, but they have a really big name in terms of the famous people that came out from that university and they are working in, you know, a regular television program. So I don't think that that, that guy is going to be there, but I mean, the university has that reputation. So maybe that uh, will, you know, bring uh, fresh air and maybe we shake a little bit the, the, the waters, uh, if you want to see that poetic view. And there is another one coming uh, from the uh, from a university that teach um, uh, history. So that it will be more important because it's going to be like you can say master class in terms because I, I really like and I focus the last 
uh, presentation that I give uh, was more uh, focused in the story and uh, part of the heliocentric model, not not just in, in you know technical stuff because. Once you realize that the water doesn't carve and the experiments show the no motion of the air and so on and so forth, you, you know, you immediately start asking questions not related with um, technical stuff, but trying to understand who perpetrates the heliocentric model. So uh, a university that um, is, you know, teaching history, they invite me to give like a lecture to the students and that will be Something that put me nervous, but it's going to be a, a nice challenge to to do. And the rest, I'm going to start. I'm going to try to restore my English YouTube channel. And in a few days, I'm going to make a video for asking a little help to trying to add for the at least the half of the flight ticket from from Amsterdam because uh, the the conference suffered a little a changes uh, changes. Uh, based on, you know, the 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 um, the ticket that they sell and things like that, so uh, it was combined here in Argentina with uh, a, a change of president, so the dollar rise up and blah blah blah. blah. So I want to try to go there because I really enjoy that kind of presentation and and I want to, uh, you know, make my my make my stuff in that kind of event. And I'm gonna try to to reach uh, the, the flight ticket and go and, you know, be there in the Globe Light Tour and, and so with Jeran and with Rodrigo. Uh, so I hope you can make it. Awesome, beautiful. Yeah, I, uh, I think that's gonna be an awesome event and I'm really looking forward to seeing the live stream. Of course, I, we weren't able to make it and uh, as a result of that, uh, uh, they gave away my position to Rodrigo, but I'm thrilled about that. I think it's awesome. So uh, very cool. So, oh, yeah, and uh, definitely check out the feconvention.com uh, website uh, because that shows the uh, not only Amsterdam, but the U.K. Uh, the conference. I'm sorry, Gary, <laughs> I forgot to mention that. I will put that in the show notes. Um, so definitely you wanted to check into that also. And, uh, uh, yeah, that'll that'll do it. Also, uh, Iru uh, Zetetic. Um, Truth Tube, um, who everybody knows, great channel, uh, said that if you see this message, which I don't know if you did or not, <laughs> but to uh, to contact him, uh, either email or um, yeah, I forgot what the other method okay. was. Yeah, so get a hold of him, yeah, Facebook or email. He says, uh, give him a, a shout out. So cool. Okay. All right. But I, I am not in the chat right now because I am on the cell phone, but uh, as soon as I get my home, I, I contact him. And everything really, really is a great, really, really great channel. Yeah, yeah, he is. I've followed him for years. It's a fabulous channel. Love it. So, all right, cool. And uh, we will move on then, last but certainly not least, to Jaron. Uh, what do you have coming up for us? Well, thanks, Bob. First off, I'm just happy we're back. Very happy you're back. Thank you for taking over the reins, and thanks to everyone in the chat the moderators and all listeners. Uh, not much. Check out Raw tomorrow night, my second channel. That's Jaronism Raw, or they can find that at tfrlive.com. And also just keep an eye on my channel for coming videos. I'm doing some NASA stuff right now, acquiring some uh, data and some reports on all the times that NASA keeps pushing out their latest. Um, this time it's when America will send people to space, most recently announced again by Pence that by the end of this year. <clears throat> but of course, I go back and show you all the times this has already been said especially by Mike Pence, who seems to every year say by the middle of next year, and then by the middle of that year, he says by the end of this year, and then by the end of that year, he says the middle of next year. Just an ongoing thing. It's the same thing over and over again. So I'll be showing this soon. And that's about it. Support me if you like and if you want. Don't if you don't. Um, no more PayPal for me. So it's down to patreon.com slash Jaronism, Venmo, at Jaronism. A few people use that. Uh, and I've been talking to some people and deciding what exactly to do with my website. Possibly I'm going to be doing something like what Marty Leeds is doing over with his site. And by the way, go sign up over there, martyleeds33.com. Uh, support what you like or it goes away. He's $5 a month. It's a cheap price for that quality of content. Um, but that's about it. So for me, just keep an eye on my channel. You never know when something's going to pop up. But appreciate everybody listening as always, and it's good to be back. All right. Beautiful. Okay. And uh, as far as uh, me, well, um, I'm just happy to be back. And, you know, obviously I've got a lot of work to do. Uh, so many things to cover and, you know, it takes me a while to put these shows together. 
So uh, I'll be doing that uh, pretty much uh, full time. Uh, well, in addition to what we're doing with FE Core, um, and I will be coordinating with those guys to uh, bring you the latest in their experimental results uh, that they're doing. And uh, again, they're doing some really fabulous work, uh, regardless of some of the ridiculous opposition that they're getting. But something we'll cover at another time, because frankly, the people that are doing this are not even really worth mentioning. Because jokers. Yeah, they're idiots. <laughs> All right, cool guys. Uh, well, with that, we'll call it a show, and uh, we will see you next week. Until then, be good to each other. Don't lie to each other. Open your mind. There's truth inside. Peace out, everybody. Peace. Thank you. Peace.